with that, uh, Emil, take it away, and we're looking forward to hearing on the wavefront sensing and the coronagraphy. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Emil Poor. I'm going to be presenting, well, this, and I'm going to try to uh, go through the off thing. Um, the, we mainly do this uh, for, uh, I mainly work on the instrumentation for high contrast imaging, uh, particularly the direct imaging of exoplanets. And here are a few pictures of uh, exoplanets observed with uh, mostly ground-based instruments, or I think all ground-based instruments here. You can see the center star that is blocked out by a coronagraph and the planet that is uh, or, uh, orbiting around it. And we've observed quite a few so far, and we've been doing this for quite a long time now, uh, so much so that we can actually see the uh, planets orbit uh, their host star uh, as a function of time uh, here on Earth. Uh, these images are all taken in the infrared, and that is quite easy because all these planets are very young planets still. Uh, they are still hot from their formation process, uh, so that, that means that you, uh, you can still see them in, in emitted light from the planet itself. However, in reflected light, uh, that is starlight uh, that is reflected from the planet, and then we observe that, that light, that is much harder because it's much, much dimmer. Uh, how dim? Uh, here's a figure showing uh, all the known exoplanets uh, as function of angular separation and showing the, the uh, planet-to-flux star ratio. And we can see uh, that most planets are on the order of 10 to the 8 uh, 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 contrast ratio, with most Earth-like planets actually going way beyond this. Uh, we haven't observed too many Earth-like planets so far, so uh, Earth-like planets are known to be at the two, uh, 10 to minus 10 level. So how do we get there? Uh, this is really close to the star, so we need a chronograph to actually suppress uh, starlight. Uh, so I'm just going to go through a one of the chronographs that I developed, which is the, the face appetized pupil Leo chronograph. And this starts with a very simple optical setup. You have your pupil of your telescope here, uh, and we put a mask in that uh, pupil. And this is a, a face mask that is designed in such a way that you have a dark zone on the other side of the star. You basically uh, try to introduce aberrations in your system uh, that force light uh, to be on the left side of the star in this case and be completely dark at a, on the right side. Of course, this is pretty difficult to do in one step. Uh, so what we do is we put a mask there that blocks all the bright sides of the star, and after that you see something like this, uh, just some, some dark stuff left. It's not really dark yet, uh, which is why we use a second stage afterwards. Uh, this stage uses a uh, uh, second pupil mask uh, that blocks out the star. So starlight will look something like this on, the, on this plane, and we block that using a, a Leo stop mask. Uh, this blocks all the bright parts and gets uh, you basically to this, this kind of system. Uh, and I have to emphasize that this mask is specifically designed not so much to put a dark zone on this side, but rather to put a dark zone all the way on the end of the optical system. So can we just put one of these chronographs on a, any space telescope and, and just expect uh, nice results? Well, no. Uh, there is a lot of stuff happening in a space telescope, and this is one of the things that's happening. The primary mirror, which I'm showing here, is in the, the face of the primary mirror, that's flexing uh, about, uh, both in global mode. You can see some very global low order formation, but also very high frequency uh, modes due to the individual segments. The individual segments are excited by cryocoolers and any other vibration, uh, star trackers, any other vibration sources on the, the uh, telescope, and you see individual segments popping up and shooting down very, very quickly on small time scales. So if we uh, put a uh, coronagraph on one of those telescopes, we're going to reach something like this. Of course, we want to uh, correct for that, and we do that by measuring uh, these aberrations and try to recover pretty much the original contrast of the chronograph, uh, but after wave control. Now, how is this done? Uh, we uh, propose to do this with uh, rejected light. Instead of removing all the starlights on the bright side of the PSF, we can reflect all of that light to a separate uh, part of the optical setup and actually measure the aberrations in that optical setup uh, on this side uh, controlling uh, the speckles and any light on uh, the, the science side of the, the this, uh, setup. So how does this uh, then uh, impact the science that we do? Here is a, a simulation performed by Chris uh, Stark uh, showing the uh, distance luminosity diagram of uh, a simulated Louvoir mission. Uh, colors here are, are discovered exoplanets either 
discovery or characterization. And characterization here is uh, just taking a spectrum in, uh, of the water lines in, in infrared. Um, and we can see that uh, for the different kind of uh, chronographs, uh, we have multiple chronographs that are each suited for different uh, kinds of, of observing conditions. And we can see that most of the, the, the uh, planets are discovered with a multitude of chronographs and characterization is mostly done by the blue one. However, we can do better. Uh, what we did is replace the red chronograph here, which is only a few discovered planets and maybe a few characterizations. We replaced that with uh, the PAPLC chronograph in this simulation. And what you get is this. So we have a whole extra row of exoplanets uh, that we can now discover. And pretty much all of the, uh, the exoplanets are characterized with uh, my chronograph. And that is just because it has higher throughput, higher, uh, lower inner working holes. We can look closer to the star, we can look deeper uh, for the same observing time. So comparing the two, you can see this very clearly. And you can see that we actually have 25% more extra Earth candidates from a simulated mission completely for free just by changing out the uh, existing chronograph with uh, the chronograph that I developed. So of course, just doing simulations is not enough. We want to actually test this. Uh, and for that, we used the uh, HiCat testbed, the high contrast imaging for imager for complex aperture telescopes, which is a testbed that's hosted right here, pretty much down uh, in the basement here. Uh, and this is a telescope that is really meant for simulating complex aperture telescopes. So segmented telescopes with non-circular uh, rounded uh, edges with uh, segments, aberrations that pop up and down uh, to really simulate that in the lab uh, and, and get experience with uh, building a whole system around that, building, doing target acquisition, digging a dark zone, making it actually dark, controlling all the aberrations, uh, and then simulate slewing, simulate uh, everything that you want on there rather than to focus on a single component of an optical setup. So here's a um, simplified schematic diagram, and this is still way too complicated for for this audience, I'm just gonna go uh, through this relatively quickly. Light source is down here, and we just go all the way through the setup and end up at the science camera right here with a lot of metrology uh, uh, in that setup. So in particular, here, here is uh, a segmented deformable mirror, and this is a mirror with a bunch of segments that we can move about in both piston and uh, rotation, tip and tilt. Uh, and we can uh, actuate that deformable mirror. This acts as a surrogate for our primary mirror of our telescope. Second, we have uh, two deformable mirrors, which are continuous deformable mirrors, and this is what we actually use to control the uh, lights on the testbed. Finally, we have the knife edge focal plane mask, uh, which reflects part of the light uh, that hits it, and anything that goes on the other side just gets transmitted straight through. And finally, you have the wave sensor. So anything that goes straight through gets captured by this camera here, uh, and anything that gets reflected gets captured by the science camera. So we worked a lot on uh, getting a new software to work, and this is a, basically a graphical user interface for that software. Uh, and the main points for this is that we enabled to run, uh, actually run asynchronous control loops on this system. And additionally, we had uh, a, a 250, 240 times faster loop speeds with this uh, system just by, by making uh, over, reducing overheads on the actual uh, software side. Uh, so first, flattening the deformable mirror, the, the, the primary mirror. This is an image without flattening. Uh, and after uh, doing some wave control and measuring what the, the pistons and tip tilts are of the, the telescope, uh, we can get this kind of image out of it much cleaner. Uh, and this is very similar to what, what James Webb did uh, during its commissioning phase. However, we can do it in a few seconds because we're in the lab. Uh, then we need to apply the appetization, the phase pattern that I spoke about very early on, uh, both the M's, and we get something like this. So you can already see the dark side is a little bit darker, but not dark enough for our taste. So we have to filter that with a Leo stop, and after that we get something like this. Uh, so we have a circular or D-shaped dark zone with some stuff still in the middle, some extra spots that we're still working on, uh, but already this gets us to uh, two times 10 minus eight uh, contrast from all the way at two lambda over D to uh, 13 lambda over D. Uh, and this is uh, much closer than the current chronographs on HiCat, uh, or my, the, the original chronographs on HiCat, uh, and we actually improved the, uh, the roll contrast as well for those. So wave sensing, this is what you would get for other types of chronographs, very blurry image of your primary, Appetization. You can basically not sense anything other than some global aberrations, which is fine for uh, current 
space telescopes which have, which have monolithic mirrors, but it's not enough for segmented mirrors. So with the PAPLC, you can see, can see something like this. So way, way cleaner. You can see all the edges of, between the segments. You can see a regular dot pattern, which are actually manufacturing defects of the default mirrors that we use. Uh, you can see so much, much with this. So really, this is way, way easier to uh, control with uh, in the end. How accurate is this? Well, we can actually sense a lot of turbulence in our setup, but that's not that interesting. Uh, for, for this audience. What is way more interesting from an instrumentation perspective is that you can see discretization of your deformal mirror. Deformal mirrors are, uh, you put voltages on them and voltages are discretized by 16-bit numbers, which means that if you try to push by less than that discretization value, you will only see some of the actuators pop up. So actuators that were close to half of a bit, they will just be above the, the uh, threshold to push them all the way up by one uh, in index. So you can see here with uh, pushing only by 20 picometers, you can uh, see a few uh, actuators pop up. And if you try to push more and more and more, you can see more and more actuators pop up. And we can really measure this uh, threshold now and then establish on the hardware what that limit is uh, for uh, wave control rather than using that doing, uh, doing that using software uh, simulations. So doing actual control, these are uh, coefficients for some of the low order modes, and you can see them wiggling around. And at a certain point, we close the loop, we stabilize everything, and everything is way nicer, way cleaner, uh, way more stabilized. And this is what we would do for an actual uh, telescope run as well. So in, uh, indeed, for slow operations, anything slower than about 10 hertz, we can suppress everything to about 15 picometers per mode, which is awfully close to the 10 picometers per mode uh, that we would need for uh, simulating a, uh, or for doing a Roman mission, uh, and uh, even for Louvre, for a future space mission, we would need uh, only uh, 10 picometers mode, uh, one picometer per mode. So we are getting closer. So I'm going to leave you with my conclusions. We demonstrated closed loop stabilization, closed loop uh, at uh, one kilohertz frequency, controlling everything below 10 hertz. Uh, we reached 1.6 nanometers RMS for those, mostly vibrations, but the turbulence we care about is uh, 75 picometers RMS over the whole, uh, all the modes. Uh, and we ran a stroke minimization loop with at four hertz, uh, getting two times nano minus eight performance. Thank you. Let's thank the speaker. <laughs> Any questions from the audience or from online? Luz? Thank you for your talk, Emil. I have a question. I don't understand why do we need asynchronous control loops and why, what are they and why do we need them? Yeah, so the, the main problem is that uh, if you just try to control, do control from, uh, let's go all the way back uh, here. If you just try to do control uh, at this plane, you can do that. And that's what we do for uh, Roman and for, for uh, past proposals for future space telescope, we have done that. However, the problem is that uh, we mainly expect low order operations for those telescopes, which means for these chronographs, we try to design them that they are suppressing them optically already, which also means that we don't get any information from this image for those modes. We only see them when it's already too bad uh, for, for us. So by using this light here, we can get a way more direct measurement of those low operations and try to correct them before they actually impact our science. It also means that we can run this loop way faster and have a very, very slow, low read noise camera, uh, maybe even a spectrograph that cannot do spatially resolved imaging and really integrate down uh, for hours rather than just a millisecond per exposure, really beating down on the read noise for those cameras. Any other questions? I do have one. How, how are the how big are the Leo stop masks and how are they fabricated? Uh, Leo stop masks for us are twenty millimeters diameter, and they are uh, laser cut. What are sort of the typical tolerances on like the exact uh, shaping of them and things like that? Is that down at the sort of um, microns or, or all the way down to the nanometers? Uh, we manufacture them, I think it's with uh, 10 or 30 micron accuracy. Uh, I might be mistaken on that. It honestly doesn't really matter. <laughs> uh, there are enough aberrations in the system that you need to do a wave control anyway. So with the wave control, you're already correcting for any deviations from those axes. What is way more uh, important is stability. You don't want it moving around by 
30 nanometer, uh, 30 microns. Mm -hmm. So moving back and forth is way worse than having a static defect in your system. Gotcha. Thank you. All right, then we're out of time. Let's thank uh, Emil again. Next up, we have Pradeep Gatkine. Uh, this oh, thank you. <laughs> Let's see. So yeah, uh, next up we have Pradeep uh, Gatkine from uh, Apple Fellow at uh, Caltech, who'll be telling us uh, about his cool work on uh, these astrophotonic spectrographs on a chip. And Pradeep, take it away. Thank you so much, Gudmundur. Uh, so hello everyone. Uh, so I'm, as Gudmundur said, I'm going to talk about astrophotonic spectrographs on a chip and uh, particularly getting ready for the next generation of uh, telescopes, both on ground and in space. Uh, so just before, before I begin the talk, I just want to give you a, a brief insight into the impact of photonics on our lives. So all the high-speed internet revolution that we have seen over the last 10 years, it has been really driven by innovation in photonics. Uh, so all the uh, high-speed internet applications like Zooms and WebExes and Google Meets and even BlueJeans that we are using these days, uh, it's all passing through uh, one of these photonic components. Uh, so photonics is really the backbone of uh, modern internet. And now photonics is enriching other fields like astronomy and vice versa. So in today's talk, uh, I'll talk about uh, why do we need astrophotonic spectrographs, uh, what, has, what we have done so far, and what's coming up next. So um, I don't have to emphasize on the importance of characterizing uh, exoplanet atmospheres, and there are at least three ways of doing it, uh, as we have seen in numerous talks, to, uh, talks throughout this uh, symposium. Uh, so transit spectroscopy, uh, precision radial velocity for, uh, for measuring the, the wobble of the star, uh, and direct, uh, di spectroscopy of directly imaged exoplanets. And they all uh, give us different uh, parameters of uh, exoplanet, uh, uh, exoplanets and uh, also require different uh, specifications in terms of the spectrograph. But all of these applications will uh, benefit from extremely large uh, ground and space-based telescopes, and they are really going to push the, science, uh, push the limits on these science cases. However, there is a catch. Uh, if we, uh, like, as we try to go ha larger and larger uh, for telescope diameters, uh, we see that the volume, mass, and cost of the telescopes that go with it, uh, uh, volume, mass, and cost of the spectrographs that go with the telescope grow as the square of the diameter. So that's for a conventional uh, spectrograph. So this is, just, just to give you an idea, this is uh, a high-resolution spectrograph on a four-meter class telescope, and there is a human standing there for scale, so it's, it's like several meters uh, in length. And with large, and you can imagine, like for a 30-meter class telescope, the, the size of the spectrograph is going to be much, much larger. You do the d square math, and you can uh, infer the size for a 30-meter class telescope. Uh, so with the size, that makes it difficult to maintain the thermal and mechanical stability uh, of the spectrograph for precision uh, spectroscopy. And that also makes it difficult to keep a steady PSF, uh, which, essentially, uh, uh, drive, which essentially drives the, um, uh, the, the resolution of the spectrograph. So just to drive that point home, uh, here is a plot showing the RV in color scale and temperature on x-axis and pressure on y-axis. So uh, if, you, if you maintain a constant temperature but just change, the, uh, if you maintain a constant pressure but just change the temperature by half a degree, you see that the radial velocity would change by uh, more than 200 meters per second. Uh, and as you know, uh, for precision radial velocity measurements, you want a stability of the order of 20 centimeters or 10 centimeters per second, and that would require temperature stability of the order of half a millikelvin. So that's the, that's the kind of difficulty that I'm talking about. So astrophotonics can help. Uh, so astrophotonics is essentially application of photonics in astronomy. And what is photonics? So photonics is uh, basically guiding the light uh, in optical circuits using fibers and waveguides. So basically a concept like this total internal reflection, uh, except that uh, waveguides in photonics look more like this, uh, where you, the size of the waveguides uh, is similar to the size of the wavelength that it is carrying. Uh, and there is a, you have a core uh, and the cladding uh, that surrounds it, which is of a lower refractive index. 
Uh, so the guided light gives us an immense flexibility in terms of molding the path of light. So with these uh, tiny waveguides, we can actually, uh, we can actually uh, very precisely control the propagation of light on a chip. Uh, and that allows us to, uh, to collapse bulky 3D optical components onto 2D chips. So with that, uh, as you increase the size of the telescope, the, the size of the chip uh, remains the same. And you can use the same chip for different kinds of telescopes. Uh, so for instance, uh, this is, uh, this is a, a chip, a low resolution spectrograph chip that I made uh, during grad school. And it's, a, it's, it's very small, like the size of a one cent coin. Uh, and these photonic spectrographs give us the advantage that they are extremely compact and they, there are no moving parts. Uh, and that makes them very easy to stabilize. Um, and at the same time, because of the precise control of the propagation of uh, light on a chip, uh, it allows us to, uh, to uh, it allows us additional uh, capabilities such as spatial filtering, uh, spectral filtering, and polarization filtering. So uh, basically, what is the advantage of using astrophotonics uh, for ground-based telescopes? It's the stability and advanced processing of light. And for uh, space-based telescopes, uh, it's mainly the compactness uh, of these uh, instruments. So I'll talk about what we have done uh, so far. So uh, just to give you an idea of what the setup, uh, what the setup of a, uh, a schematic of an integrated uh, AWG would look like. So you have uh, the starlight going through the atmosphere, turbulent atmosphere, and you have the adaptive optics, which uh, partially corrects the uh, partially corrects the wave front uh, of the light coming in, uh, and that is fed to something called a photonic lantern. So when the light is partially uh, corrected with uh, adaptive optics, you still get light that um, that is like multimoded. So it has basically diff uh, multiple degrees of freedom. It can propagate in um, like using. Uh, essentially, like with multiple refractive indices, uh, to, to put it in simple terms. Um, and what a photonic lantern does is that it converts this multi-moded light into multiple single-moded light. So single mode you can think about as just one degree of freedom or essentially diffraction-limited propagation. So uh, a photonic lantern converts a multi-moded uh, wavefront into multiple uh, sort of diffraction-limited wavefronts or uh, uh, single-mode uh, propagation. So this is what a photonic uh, lantern looks like. So um, the orange uh, side that you have, that's the multi-mode end, and the, all the other greens, uh, those, those are all the single-mode ends. So I'm just going to keep it here, uh, which, so you can take a look at it later. Uh, but, but that's what uh, it does. And once you have the light into single-mode fibers, then you can feed the light into photonic chips. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about the chip next. So the way this uh, AWG or array waveguide grating spectrograph work, uh, so th that's the architecture that we're using for implementing photonic spectrographs. Um, so the array waveguide gratings work in a very, uh, the way they work is very similar to a diff normal diffraction grating. So you have uh, the light coming in, getting collimated with a lens, uh, incident on a diffraction grating. So diffraction grating creates the path differences. And with those path differences, you get constructive interference of different wavelengths at different locations. And that's what you call a spectrum. So in a photonic uh, array we get grating, you have uh, the light coming in through a single mode fiber, as, as we just discussed. And it goes to, uh, and it illuminates essentially this array of uh, waveguides. So this array of waveguides, just you can precisely control uh, the path length of each of the beams, and you create a phased array. And with that phased array, you get uh, different, you get like uh, constructive interference of different wavelengths at different locations. And that spectrum can be sampled uh, either using discrete waveguides or directly imaged on a detector. So this is, uh, this is one of the proof of concept devi uh, devices that we built uh, last year. Uh, so this, uh, this is uh, an AWG that was designed in H-band, uh, so 1450 to 1700 nanometers. Uh, and it was designed for a resolving power of uh, 12,000 and a free spectral range of 2.8 nanometers. So uh, we can say that this uh, free spectral range is uh, very small, uh, but uh, we have designed uh, more devices which have a larger uh, free spectral range. And each of these black uh, sort of tracks that you see, their cross section looks like this. So there is silicon nitride in the center, that's the core, that is surrounded by silicon dioxide. So the size of the uh, core is 800 nanometers by 800 nanometers. And the size of the chip is really, really small. It's only two, cent, two, nano, two millimeter by uh, seven millimeters, so just like about two grains of rice. And just to show some of the results of this, uh, so each of the humps that you see here uh, is a spectral order. And on x-axis, you have the wavelengths. On y-axis, you have the, uh, the normalized power. 
and uh, basically we get like uh, as designed like the we get the free spectral range of 2.8 nanometer uh, and the crosstalk so the like the contrast level of the of each of those peaks so each of these peaks is essentially the spectral channels and the crosstalk of each of these peaks is about uh, three percent uh, that is comparable to a conventional uh, spectrograph and the peak throughput that we uh, had was about 11 percent uh, but we have identified ways and most of the uh, light is actually lost in getting the light from single mode fiber to uh, uh, to the chip and we have identified ways uh, in improving that to push this uh, throughput from 11 percent to 40 percent uh, and the next chip that we built uh, this is uh, at a much higher resolving power and a larger free spectral range. So this is our latest chip. Uh, so this chip has a small size again, uh, like two centimeter by two centimeter. Uh, and this one has a resolving power of 28,000. So, uh, so here is just like some of the peaks uh, I'm showing for, uh, for reference and the channel spacing is 0 0.05 nanometers. So you do the lambda divided by delta lambda and you get the resolving power of 28,400. And this one has a free spectral range of 15 nanometers. So we are getting much closer to an, a, a, an astronomical uh, quality spectrograph. And this one actually works over a wide band. So 1250 to 1700 nanometers. It's a J and H combined. And the size of this uh, whole chip is only two centimeter by two centimeters. So although there is a coin there for comparison, uh, I, I like to use a much more delicious comparison, which is a Hershey's bar. Um, and I have, uh, I have some of those chips here. And I'm just going to show uh, them here for uh, for our, our our online audience, and I think they're going to be zoomed in, I guess. Uh, and if you're done, uh, okay. So if you're done, I'm going to pass these around uh, for you uh, to take a look. Um, so. Uh, in, in, in the spirit of uh, pushing the resolving power, we, we went a, a, a little bit further ahead and, uh, and went uh, and, and designed an AWG with a resolving power of 43,000. It also sits on the same chip, uh, and, but it has a smaller size because it has a smaller free, uh, free spectral range. Um, but basically, this uh, AWG also has a resolving power of 43,500. So we're getting closer to like the precision uh, uh, radial velocity measurement kind of domain. Uh, and it has a free spectral range of one nanometer. So that was, that was just to see whether this idea, this design would work. And now once we have identified that it works, we, will, we are going to push the uh, free spectral, we, we are going to push for a larger free spectral range for this uh, device. But basically, um, yeah, that one, uh, this one also covers a wide, uh, wide band, like 1250 to 1700 nanometers, so J and H band in astronomy. And it has a size of two centimeter by one centimeter. So what's next? Um, so these uh, astro like uh, these astronomical spectrographs, uh, if you want to image the uh, the light, image the uh, spectrum coming out of them, then you have to use something called a cross dispersion optics. Uh, and the reason why you have to use that is because these spectral these different spectral orders. So let's say order m, order m plus one, m plus two. These different spectral orders they overlap on top of each other. So the AWG does the dispersion uh, within a spectral order, but they, uh, the spectral orders themselves overlap on top of each other. So with cross dispersion, you can actually separate them out uh, into each uh, spectral order and then image it on a detector. But we don't want to use uh, a conventional bulk optics dispersion because we don't want any moving parts here. So uh, we have actually uh, designed an uh, AWG uh, architectures where you have a coarse AWG that splits the light into each different uh, like uh, free spectral range. And each of those free, free spectral range are, ranges are then uh, dispersed by uh, these high resolution AWGs. Um, and the concept here, like the use case here is to use it for a nice diffraction limited um, uh, image and then have each fiber for uh, each fiber for each source and then one spectrograph per fiber. So basically you can stack a lot of these spectrographs and have uh, like a multi-object uh, spectrograph concept. Uh, this, is, uh, this is another future detection that we are exploring right now. Uh, so let's say you have a spectrum and you want different resolving power for different uh, parts of the spectrum, uh, uh, different parts of the spectrum. So let's say you break it down into three and you want, uh, let's say th there is a feature here, so you want high resolution, uh, there is no feature here, so you want low resolution, and there is uh, some feature here, but less light, so you want like a moderate resolution here. Uh, and you can do that with photonic spectrographs. So um, here is a low resolution spectrograph, which splits the light into chunks of eight nanometer each. And you can then feed this to a high, like several high resolution uh, spectrographs, or you can select another uh, part of the spectrum and feed it to a low resolution spectrograph. 
and you can select another part of the spectrum and feed it to a high, to another to a even lower resolution spectrograph what, whatever is your uh, requirement for the science case uh, and the way to do that is basically by uh, combining uh, by by uh, by plugging in these outputs to either a high resolution moderate resolution or a low resolution spectrograph and you don't even have to do plugging and unplugging it can all, all be done uh, electronically uh, thanks to the commercial uh, photonics uh, technologies that are available. So I think I'm out of time. So I'm not going to talk about the uh, dynamic control uh, of, a of a frequency comb. So basically that's like for uh, calibration purposes, uh, but a frequency comb, a laser frequency comb actually varies a lot in power. So we have designed an active photonic device. Uh, so the active photonic device can actually, so this is like one of the active photonic device uh, where we can control the interferences, constructive and destructive interferences and convert a uh, very jagged, uh, very uh, highly variable uh, uh, laser frequency comb like this, which varies by almost a factor of thousand to something that varies only by a factor of three. So it, it allows us to build a flatter frequency comb. Um, so we, with, with these uh, dynamic, uh, dynamic spectrum flatteners uh, that we have built using photonics, uh, we can actually reduce the power variation from a thousand X to three X for laser frequency combs. Um, so with all the three, uh, three of these projects in pipeline, we have a next project uh, that is coming up very soon, uh, pushing the resolving power to uh, 1, uh, 200,000. Uh, and the design has been made, the chips have been fabricated, and uh, we are almost getting ready for uh, characterizing these chips. Uh, so with that, I will stop, and I'll take any questions. I think, Pradeep. Okay, time for one very lightning quick question. Uh, yes, uh, so the throughput for the chip that we built before uh, was 11, per the, that was the, uh, the one that we built before, that was 11%, and the one that we have built now, we haven't characterized the throughput yet, but we anticipate that its throughput would be around 25%. What's, what's the, what is the thing that you're changing to get more throughput though? Uh, the technology to feed the light uh, from single mode fiber to the chip. Uh, and there are technologies that exist, but they are not in the commercial domain yet. Uh, we can do that in the lab, but they're, they're, we, like, we can't like, just place an order and uh, get it done um, in a commercial foundry yet. So yeah, there are solutions, but we need to get them to a scalable level. Awesome, let's thank uh, Pradeep again. All right, next up we have uh, uh, Michael Wang uh, from Carnegie, who will be telling us about atmospheric chemical networks. Michael, take it away. All right, thanks, Goodwinder. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. First thing I need to do, of course, is to thank the leads, Don, Andy, Paul, for this opportunity. Thank the SOC and everybody who's contributed to this symposium so far. It's been wonderful to learn from you all this week. Um, and I, of course, have to thank my colleagues uh, on the project that I'm about to share with you today, Drs. Anurud Prabhu, Jason Williams, Jonna Morrison, and Bob Hazen. So the dream for me is to one day reach a point where we're able to take an exoplanet target and get to know its atmospheric chemistry via the you know, myriad number of spectroscopic techniques that we talked about on Wednesday morning, maybe with some of the instruments that we just learned about, uh, and use that atmospheric chemistry to determine whether or not this world belongs to the ensemble of living planets or the ensemble of non-living planets. And in this talk, I want to make a case that a high dimensional phase space of network metrics could be one possibly novel way of approaching this problem. So what do I mean by network metrics? So atmospheric chemical networks can be dis displayed as a graph where the nodes of this graph are the different chemical species that you find in that planet's atmosphere, and the links in this graph are the reactions between them. So by way of example, this is phosphine in a subset of Saturn's atmospheric network. We see in this network that phosphine is directly connected to five other molecules, and so we would say that this node has a degree of five in network science parlance. Okay, so what I'm showing you here are four networks that represent the atmospheric chemistry of four different planetary bodies in our solar system. 
Titan, Venus, early Earth, early Mars, and modern Earth. And they are colored by the degree of their nodes. So that's, again, how many nodes that particular degree is connected to. And those nodes are also sized by the betweenness centrality. So that's how many shortest paths between other nodes in the network pass through that particular node. So it's a measure of control or influence that that node has on the network. And you can immediately see, just qualitatively, that these networks are distinct from one another. For instance, Titan has a very symmetric network that is centered upon hydrogen chemistry. Venus has these various oxygen and sulfur and chlorine-bearing radicals that pull its network into a kind of lopsided shape. And early Earth and modern Earth have their own unique nodes that act as hubs that give these networks their unique structures. So you can qualitatively learn a lot just by staring at these. You can also quantify these networks and uh, understand how they are different and similar that way. So that's what I'm showing you here in these bar graphs. What I've done is calculated two of the global network metrics for you. One is the network degree assortativity. This is a measure of how heterogeneous the network is. So the lower the number here, the more heterogeneous the network is. Transitivity is a clustering coefficient. It's basically asking for any given node, are the neighbors of that node likely to be neighbors of each other as well? And so what you can see here is that Earth's network, shown in the blue uh, bar, is not just distinct from that of other planetary networks, but is also a little bit more similar to biological networks in these network metrics. So I've given you a metabolic network, a neural network, and a marine food web network in the green here. And so this leads us to a very tantalizing question, which is, could this be because Earth's atmosphere has co-evolved with a biosphere for four billion years, exchanging metabolic gases, and of course, more recently, also our technosphere? So in order to approach this really big question, the first thing that we need to do is try to analyze the myriad other ways that potentially Earth's network is different from a, an abstract topological sense from the other planetary networks in our solar system. So one good way of analyzing and characterizing um, uh, networks in general is through what's called centrality metrics. So centrality metrics are a measure of how important nodes are in the network, but importance, of course, is a very vague concept. There's many different ways of being important. So there are many different centrality metrics out there in the literature. Classic ones being degree, closeness, and betweenness centrality. So degree centrality measures how popular a, a, a node is. Post the centrality is a distance metric between uh, th that node and the rest of the network. And between the centrality, which we've been introduced to already, is how many shortest path links pass through that node, and therefore is a measure of control. All of these classic centrality metrics, to my mind, are imperfect. For instance, the degree centrality is a very local metric. It doesn't really care about the structure of the network beyond a node's nearest neighbors. And distance, or closeness and between the centrality, assume that influence only travels along the shortest path links in the network, but this may not necessarily be true. So I've turned to another centrality metric called information centrality to uh, fix these kind of issues. So information centrality, in information centrality, we model the network as a, a series of nodes in which signals can propagate across the network, not just by the shortest path between the nodes, but through all possible paths between the nodes. So uh, for instance, in this uh, schematic here, between nodes one and two, you could go the shortest path, but you can also go through these more roundabout ways. Those suffer from certain penalties due to their length. So this is also sometimes called current flow centrality. I find that this is a really more useful way of characterizing chemical networks because, as we know, in chemistry, molecules don't just influence each other directly. For instance, in atmospheric chemistry, it's really important to take into account uh, uh, catalytic cycles that are important for producing products from their precursors. So what I'm showing you in this graph is the degree is the distribution of information centrality for all the nodes in the various planetary atmospheric networks that we have analyzed. And you can see immediately that Earth's network in the green has a degree has a, has a information centrality distribution that is very different from a vast majority of the other planets in our solar system, with potentially a, a confounding factor of Jupiter. And this is something that we've actually noticed in a lot of our uh, metric studies, is that the metrics for Jupiter's network and Earth's network sometimes appear very similar. And I think this is because in Jupiter, you have a lot of dredging up of out of equilibrium chemicals from the deep recesses of Jupiter's atmosphere, bringing them up into the higher atmosphere where, the, where they then can mix with uh, the, the photochemical products. Is there a way, though, that we can somehow separate out modern Earth and Jupiter? 
And indeed there is, if we enter a higher dimensional phase space of network metrics where now we're using three metrics, the information centrality that I was showing you on the previous plot, augmented by the log of the subgraph centrality, which is yet another centrality metric that tries to measure information flow within a network, and the average neighbor degree on that final axis. And in this three-dimensional space, you can start to see Earth and Jupiter's network separate, and indeed, all of the planetary bodies in our solar system tend to occupy a unique region of this phase space. Another thing that we've been trying to do to characterize these complex networks is what's called agglomerative hierarchical clustering and heat maps. So in these heat maps, what I'm showing you is the distances between different nodes in the network. Black is a very low distance, zero distance. So these diagonals that you see here are basically the distance between that node and itself in the network. And when you plot these heat maps, you can start to see different structures appear in the networks, and you can start to attribute these structures to different chemical species. So for instance, in Jupiter's network, some of its uh, complexity ar arrives from phosphorus-bearing compounds. Indeed, if you took out those phosphorus-bearing compounds from the network, you would get a more bland heat map, like the hydrocarbon and nitrile chemistry in Titan's atmosphere. Venus, of course, has a lot of polysulfur in its atmosphere, derived from radicals such as uh, sulfur dioxide photolysis. And then Earth's atmosphere, a lot of its structure in these heat maps comes from the chlorofluorocarbons that we have pumped into the atmosphere as a result of industrial activity. So is, uh-oh, dimming the beach ball. Okay, is the fact that um, Earth's atmospheric network seems to be distinct from those of other planetary bodies, just a mere fact of the matter that we know more about our own atmospheric chemistry than uh, those of the other planets. So we start to test this by comparing our atmospheric networks to their equivalent random networks. These are randomly generated networks with the same number of nodes and edges in those networks. So this is what Earth's network looks like. This is what its equivalent random network looks like. It's much more homogeneous. And then you can run your metrics on our atmospheric networks, run the, those same metrics on the equivalent random networks and compare the two. And when we do so, indeed, we find that Earth's network is the most non-random of all of the chemical networks. If you take the uh, transitivity of Earth's network divided by the transitivity of its equivalent random network, we find that Earth has the largest transitivity ratio. And you can do the same with all the centrality metrics. And here I'm showing you that Earth's uh, network has the highest subgraph centrality. So Earth's network still stands out from those of other planetary networks, even when compared to its equivalent random network. Okay, so this is just the beginning of the story. Um, let me show you what I'll, I'll be doing as a part of this three-year NHFP program. So task one in the proposal that I submitted was to do this kind of network analysis for these simple networks that I've been showing you today. So studying our solar system atmospheres using what are called unipartite unweighted and undirected networks. These are the networks we've been looking at for the past 10 minutes. Uh, step two is to introduce more advanced network metrics. So for instance, we would have weighted networks where the weights correspond to the reaction rates between those molecules. This will leverage a whole bunch of new information from the photochemical models that we run to uh, characterize these types of planets. And then we also want to develop novel network metrics, so new ways of trying to assess the amount of information and information flow within these networks. And as a result of tasks one and two, we'll determine a new suite of tools that we can use to best distinguish atmospheres using their chemistry, and then leverage that in task three, where we'll simulate planetary ensembles, so Earth through time, Earth-like exoplanets through time, hypothetical exoplanet biospheres through time, and then utilize all of the insights that we gain from tasks one and two to try to map out this phase space to, to understand if we can truly use network metrics to identify and distinguish biotic planets from abiotic planets. So let me recap what we've learned today. Uh, number one is that Earth's atmosphere is distinct from those of other planetary bodies in numerous ways. And in certain network metrics, Earth's network resembles living networks, which is really intriguing. And this is not simply due to the fact that Earth's uh, atmosphere has a unique number of nodes and edges, because when compared to their equivalent random networks, Earth still stands out. And so the big question that I want to chase over the next three years is, can network science reveal a general class of agnostic biosignatures at the planetary scale? In other words, does life 
rearrange and reorder the flows of matter and energy and information in a planet at the planetary scale that can be determined through atmospheric chemistry. We're just at the beginning of this journey, um, but I'd be happy to update you on the progress in a year's time at the next Hubble Symposium. Thank you very much. Questions? Hey, super cool talk. Um, so I had kind of two related questions. Um, so it seems like a lot of these network metrics rely on a good understanding of like these pathways between different molecules. Um, so my first question was given that even with like Louvoir or something, we may detect only like five or so molecules in a planet's atmosphere. I was wondering what's like the minimum number of nodes and paths you need to know about to be able to apply these to a planet. And then kind of related to that, I was wondering um, how robust these metrics are to um, if you have like a missing node, like for example, nitrogen chemistry is important on Earth, but we wouldn't be able to detect N2 in a planet's atmosphere. These are fantastic questions, Megan. So the first answer, uh, the first question is regarding, you know, how can we infer the full network from just a handful of known species that we might get with, you know, JWC and Louvoir um, or Louvex, Louvex, whatever we're calling it these days. <laughs> um, and the answer is that that's sort of like task four. Um, that's something that we definitely want to do in our future work, which is to use machine learning methods and association analysis to basically use a sparse data set to then infer the full network uh, of, of, a, of a planet. Uh, and so that's something that my colleague at Carnegie, Honorud Prabhu, is an expert at, um, using association analysis for, say, predicting new mineral species. He's a geoinformatics scientist, and I'm learning so much from him. Uh, sitting next to him in our office, you know, from a data science perspective and applying it to these networks. And I think that's something that we definitely want to get to in our future work. Uh, and then your, your next question was about missing nodes. And it's absolutely critical too, right? So we won't get to know every single kind of molecule in a planet's atmosphere. Of course, the association analysis and machine learning will help us get to some of those missing nodes. Uh, but one thing that we can do, you asked about the sensitivity, is to randomly subtract certain uh, nodes out of our planetary atmospheric networks right now and ask how do those metrics change. And so that's something that we're also working on is say we knew only 90% of the nodes in Titan's atmosphere, does it change, does it make a big difference? And the answer is, Usually not for the very higher order hydrocarbons because they're sort of at the edges of the network. But if, for instance, you didn't know that there was nitrogen on the planet, yes, that would make a huge difference. Yeah, although we have some more questions in the interest of time, uh, let's uh, continue and let's thank Michael again. If you do have more questions, uh, feel free to follow up with Michael. I'm sure he's happy to, to answer questions offline and or uh, on Slack. All right, next up we have uh, Sebastian uh, from uh, University of Arizona who's going to be talking about Mac AOX and direct imaging. Take it away. Thank you. Okay. Now? Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, direct imaging. Um, it's this one. Yeah, so direct imaging. We really want to understand planet formation, planet evolution, and just understand the um, just the formation of planets in general because we're wondering um, how do planets form and how did Earth form and how does life originate from these planets? And f to do that, we really want to understand like planets in across all kinds, all ages. So I'm going through a couple examples. So here you can see uh, the two planets in PDS-70. It's about a five mega year planetary system. We found another one in the WISIS-2 uh, system, which is uh, 14 mega years. And there's of course a very famous one, was already shown a couple times. It's HR 8799, which is about 42 mega years. So as you see, all these planet systems are quite young. Uh, and that will not help us to understand like planet formation throughout the entire history of, uh, of uh, most planetary systems. So 
why cannot we, why is it so difficult to find older planets? So first of all, when planets uh, age, so when they, uh, in, at the start of their formation, they're really hot due to the formation processes and they cool down during their lifetime. And not only do they cool down, they also contract a little bit. And a combination of those two effects uh, cause them to be really, start, let's see, yeah, so here's like laser pointer. So as a function of age, they will cool down and the luminosity goes down by many orders of magnitude. As you can see here, so this purple line is roughly a two Jupiter mass planet. And you can see here that at, this, that at the beginning, they're, at light, they're like a couple times 10 to the minus five solar luminosity. But at the end, uh, like it's about uh, like time scales that we currently have in, on Earth, the planet has become like 10 to the minus nine. So it has become like four orders of magnitude fainter. And it's even worse for uh, Earth-like planets, which are, so this is a five, uh, five times five Earth mass planets. You can see it starts at 10 to the minus eight, but it goes down to 10 to the minus 10. So it's way, way fainter than the sun. So current instrument, so first of all, the first part of their life, we cannot really find planets because they're embedded in the protopla uh, protoplanetary disk around stars. And there's too much dust. So the only thing we can do is we can go for older planets and with the current instrument limits, we can sort of find Jupiter mass planets out to about 10 mega years. And that's also what we see in uh, all our observations is that if we do direct imaging, we found planets around, we found Jupiter like planets or heavier planets around 10 mega years. So we need to improve our instruments to push down in contrast in sensitivity. We want to go for fainter planets and it means we will be able to go to lower mass planets. So now the question is, what is limiting us in direct imaging? And the answer is actually everything. There's nothing that's not limiting us. So we need to improve on everything in, in, uh, in the instruments. And that's also one of the reasons why direct imaging is so difficult because fixing one issue does not actually help. We need to fix all issues at the same time. Um, and that's why it takes a really long time for us to really improve the sensitivity. So, but we try to do that. And um, at Arizona, we have built the uh, MAGEOX system, which is an extreme adaptive optics system. And we actually hope that we are, um, well, at least we do not hope, we are actually working on improving like all qualities of adaptive optics and direct imaging to get a more extreme system. Um, so MAGEOX has been designed to do visible at extreme adaptive optics. And that means we're getting a uh, quality that other AO systems get at H band or K band. So we try to get that in I and Z band. So we try to go really push to lower limits. Um, and in the past three years, I have done a lot of lab work because of COVID, rule, uh, COVID regulations, I was not able, we were not able to go to the telescope that much. So we've been mainly working in the lab to improve the performance of Maggio X. So one of the things that I worked with, uh, on was to do uh, predictive control. So currently AO systems are always lagging behind. Um, they measure the atmosphere, they want to correct the atmosphere, but the moment you measure it and you then apply a correction, you're always behind, you're always trying to catch up with the atmosphere. So you need to do some type of prediction of your system and of your future states so that you can anticipate what's going to happen and correct before things uh, have actually happened. And I did that with some linear type of machine learning because everybody is doing machine learning nowadays. And effectively, you just feed all everything you know about the system. You feed it in a, in a machine learning algorithm, and you get an optimal control trajectory out that tries to do this anticipation. And that should help improve our performance. So the second thing that's what, uh, what uh, one of the grad students in our group has done is, is to correct for instrument errors. So here on the top left, you can see the PSF with some residual uh, PSF, uh, some errors. Okay, so the color scheme did not work out very well, but the PSF is still asymmetric. They're, the airy rings are breaking up. But after his correction algorithm, we, are, we actually have very nice high quality uh, point spread functions that are completely symmetric, or at least the airy rings do not break up anymore. And the last part is that even if you do the uh, correction for all your instrument errors, you still have speckles that leak through your chronograph. I mean, Emil Poor showed that this morning, but here on the top, you can see the speckles that even after this really good correction for all the instrument effects, you can see that there are still a lot of light from the star that leaks through the chronograph and we need to get rid of that. So we have also been working on uh, implementing speckle control algorithms to get, uh, get rid of them. 
So hopefully by implementing all these different types of waveform control algorithms to uh, remove instrumental effects, we were able to push a, about a factor of 10 in uh, sensitivity. So we should be able to start going to, uh, we should be able to start observing um, sub-Jupiter mass planets with MEGAOX. So the reason why we cannot go re any deeper than 10 to the minus 7 is that this is really the photon noise limit of the telescope. So if we want to go any deeper, we really need to go to like the next generation of GMT, ELT, or TMT telescopes. Because going for 10 to the minus 7 telescopes, uh, 10 to the minus 7 contrast planets with MEGAOX takes about 10 nights of observing time. So going any deeper will be very difficult. Um, so MEGAOX has been in the lab for quite a while. And last April, we finally had the chance to go to the telescope for the first time. So here you can see us unpacking MEGAOX. We put it on, a cra on, a, on this um, truck and drove it up to the telescope. And we mounted it on the telescope. And we were actually uh, very happy that it went, all, it went quite smooth. So MEGAOX has observed, and this is the team. So we went there with about seven people. And you can see that we're all wear, wearing uh, the same hoodies, and that's uh, the MEGAOX uh, hoodies. And they were made by, uh, yeah, well, Joseph, Joseph and Evelyn are both now graduate students. So MEGAOX uh, worked really well. So here you can see the older type of AO instrument. So this, is, this quality is comparable to what MEGAO, which was the precursor of MEGAOX, could do, and uh, Sphere. But now we have much more improved uh, quality in PSFs. So with MEGAOX, we can actually go for, uh, we get, like, we almost got double the performance in, uh, in the instrument. So it's really a, a major improvement between the two modes. And that made us quite happy. So we have done some early science. So here are some early science results. So we saw, we looked at uh, PZL, which is a magnetospheric uh, active uh, M star. We were able to observe, uh, we were able to do adaptive optics in G-band, which is really difficult. There's almost no other instrument that can do G-band adaptive optics. Um, we were able to, we look at debris disks. So there's a lot of science that we have done in our first run. We are quite happy. So MEGAOX works well. We can do adaptive optics. We can do imaging. However, MEGAOX did not have a spectrograph, so it could not do any characterization except for broadband imaging, which is difficult to use if you want to do actual characterization. So as, well, as part of uh, my Hubble Fellowship, I have also built a spectrograph. So here you can see a sort of schematic. So we have light from MEGAOX entered on the top, then it goes through the system, dispersed by uh, a grating or a prism, and it went to the detector. So in this spectrograph was actually is made for two different types of observing modes. We have this wide field emission line mode because uh, at a high resolving power and a um, small bandwidth. So this is pretty much only targeting H alpha. And the goal of this mode is to really look for uh, H alpha signatures in uh, accreting protoplanets or to look at uh, stellar outflows, for example. So it's really targeting emission lines at high resolution. And the other mode is a classical uh, wide field, low resolution mode that allows you to do broadband characterization. So the broadband mode works quite well. So here you can see on the left the PSF at 450 nanometers all the way to 950 nanometers. So there was a little bit of defocus when we took the data, so it's not completely sharp. But we fixed it later in the, in the run, but I have not reduced that data. And we also have the high resolution mode, which is really, uh, which is working quite well. So this is an image of Antares, and I've selected one of the spectra in the uh, spectrograph to show that we are able to get nice high quality, high signal to noise spectra. And one of the things that is, I think, nice to uh, mention is that this instrument gives resolved spectro does resolved spectroscopy. So you get spectra for different points in the field of view. So in this case, this data set was actually taken to do resolved uh, spectroscopy of the surface of Antares. Because we are, with MEGAOX, we are able to resolve um, like just about two or three pixels across the surface of Antares. So what are the science cases for um, PhysX together with MEGAOX? Well, we want to go for uh, accreting protoplanets. They have H-alpha emission, so we want to characterize that. Uh, we want to look, go for stellar jets, stellar outflows, because they also show up in emission. 
uh, broadband characterization of uh, low mass companions. We want to look at closely interacting binary stars because uh, with, that have mass transfer. So we want to be able to characterize them and we want to do, uh, as I said, resolve stellar surfaces that high spectral resolution to measure rotations. So in conclusion, we have done a lot of work in the past two, three years to do uh, instrument uh, improvements. So we are quite happy that MAGUX is now slowly going towards its design limits. And we are very close. I think our next observing run in November will really put us at the uh, design specifications. And we have a dedicated spectrograph for MAGUX. Thank you. Let's thank our speaker. Questions? Hi, uh, thanks for that great talk. So um, I had a question about the spectrograph. Um, yep. So I guess, I'm sorry if I missed it, but is, did you mention that? So is the spectrograph, is that, does that come with an IFU or is that a slit on the? No, it's, it's an IFU, I skipped over it. Okay. It, it's an IFU. Okay. So you uh -huh. can, so th these are the uh, images that come out of the IFU. I see. Okay. And, and what is the typical limiting magnitude for a one night observation? Um, so I think for a one hour observation, it will be about 19th magnitude or 20th magnitude. So it's pretty typical uh, limit for an IFU. Um, the but the actual limit is caused by our AO system. So even though you can point at it, uh, you can use it to look at things. If the AO system does not lock, uh, you cannot really do anything. And that limit is about 10th or 11th magnitude on the primary. Yeah, I think I, I missed something it, about, I think, this, the self-emission, right, in how much it dropped. But here you're talking about reflected emission, right? Um, well, I mean, in, in Z-band, you might still get part of it. <laughs> but, but, it but, but you didn't show it leveling off. So how, what, what, what sort of levels did you get? Well, so, um, so we hope that we can use this to see if we can get parts of the optical spectrum of the, of the brighter the younger companions. Um, we have not done a, I have not done the end-to-end -end sen sensitivity uh, measurements yet for that, for this particular mode, because this was added way later in the project. Like the primary mode was this high resolution mode, and then later I realized it could very easily add this broadband mode. So this mode has been not as much developed yet. <laughs> yeah. And maybe one thing to know, uh, to say maybe to people that are interested here is that MAGIOX is open for everybody that's in the Magellan Consortium. So if you're at a, at a partner institute of Magellan, you can apply for time on MAGIOX. So if anyone is interested to do any type of high resolution science, uh, please contact us because uh, you can propose for time. Awesome. Let's thank Sebastian again. Next up, we have So Todd, who will be giving a remote talk. So are you on? I, yeah, I can see you there. When you're ready, Here, feel free. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Do you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen now. Perfect. All right. Uh, yeah, feel free to take it away, So. All right. Thank you so much. My name is Zoe Todd, and I am a third year Sagan Fellow at the University of Washington. And today I'm going to give a fairly chemistry based talk on prebiotic fatty acid vesicles and how they grow in the presence of prebiotic building blocks. So, just to take a step back and uh, let you know a little bit about my research interests. So, my main research focus is understanding how the planetary environment can influence origins of life. So, specifically, I'm interested in tracing out this p continuous path from the environments that are readily available from the astronomical and planetary perspective, and how those can influence the synthesis of precursors of life. So biomolecules like sugars and amino acids, so on and so forth. And then how those precursors can come together and self-assemble into a self-replicating and ultimately evolving protocell that we might call the first life. So tracing out the continuous path of these steps and especially keeping them in the perspective of the planetary environment is what I'm interested in. And the talk that I'm going to be giving today focuses very much on this third step here towards protocells. So just a little bit of a background on protocells and apologies for the flashbacks to high school biology. I hope it's not traumatizing for anyone. Uh, but so if we think about the origin of Earth here 4.5 billion years ago, and then here we are today with our current biology, 
So cells today uh, look very complex. So we have two different types of cells in life today, eukaryotic and prokaryotic. Um, and just looking at these images here, ignoring all the details, you can see that they are very complex things today. So in all likelihood, when the first life emerged, it was not entirely this complex, but it's much more likely that something very simple was present at the origin of life, something like a protocell is what we might call this. And then over time, it has evolved to the complexity that we see today. So a uh, little bit of a background on potentially important biomolecules for origins of life. So one biomolecule that life presumably needs are sugars. And so this domino sugar that maybe you put in your coffee this morning or you use when you bake cookies is actually the molecule sucrose shown here, chemical formula. So, um, this is one type of sugar. Another type of sugar that is potentially important for origins of life is ribose, which is the sugar that makes up RNA. So sugars are important because they're a component of building blocks of other molecules for life. They are used for energy. They are used for many things in life today. Another type of biomolecule are proteins. So these are comprised of individual amino acids. Um, here's the chemical structure of one amino acid called alanine. And then if you string together two amino acids, you get something called a dipeptide, di for two. And then if you string together many amino acids like this, you can get a polypeptide, which is just another word for protein. Proteins are important for life because they can catalyze reactions that otherwise would not occur on significant timescales. I mean, life uses them for building blocks and for metabolism and many other things as well. So here's your protein powder. Eat your protein powder. Uh, and then we also have a third biomolecule, our nucleic acids. So these are things like DNA and RNA that life uses today. So DNA and RNA have five letters total. Um, here is the letter A, adenine, and here is the letter C, cytidine. And these are important, nucleic acids are important because they allow for heredity, for passing on information from parent to daughter, and for the eventual incorporation of mutations and evolution to occur. And then finally, our fourth biomolecule are lipids. So lipids are essentially vegetable oil, or butter are all lipids. Uh, and so lipids are important for life for many reasons, for energy storage, um, metabolism, but also because they make up cell membranes. And since my talk is going to focus a little bit more on lipids today, just to give a little bit of background on cell membranes. So our current cell membranes are made up of phospholipid bilayers. So a phospholipid is a type of molecule pictured here schematically where you have this purple head that likes water and these two blue tails that do not like water. So if you put these lipids in water, they're going to spontaneously self-assemble into this bilayer that can then form a little bubble where you have water on the inside and water on the outside. And this is what encapsulates our cells. So basically, if you take these four biomolecules and you mix them together in your prebiotic soup and you somehow assemble them into a protocell where potentially you have proteins and RNA inside so that you can do chemistry and do reactions, and you have them encapsulated in a fatty acid membrane or a lipid membrane, maybe that's your first protocell, and maybe that's the first thing that you would call life. I will, however, note that not everyone agrees that the origin of life passed through this protocell stage, and we still don't know for sure exactly how it happened. So this is one option, but it's not, not the only option. So these protocells, I will probably also call these vesicles uh, during my talk. They're interchangeable, the same thing. Uh, they can grow in a plausible manner on the early Earth. So, for example, if you have this initial protocell or this initial vesicle with this bilayer here, um, and you add more lipids in the form of these micelles, which have a different structure where you can see it's just these tails pointed on, together on the inside, you can actually get these lipids incorporating into this protocell and allow for the growth of this vesicle or protocell in radius. So this is really cool because it's a way for an environmentally driven growth of these protocells, and then you can get environmentally driven division just by shear stress. Whereas our cells today, in order to grow and divide, have an incredibly complex cellular machinery that would not have been present at the origin of life. So keeping in mind my research question of wanting to understand how these processes occur in the planetary environment, we wanted to ask the question, how does the presence of additional biomolecules affect protocell growth? So understanding, can this protocell growth occur in the chemical and planetary environment that is likely present on the early Earth? So we basically did some experiments testing this. So in this top row here, what I'm showing you is 
the addition of adenosine. So adenosine is this chemical structure shown right here. It's a nucleobase, um, the letter A in DNA and RNA. And so here we're looking at the radius of the protocell or the radius of the vesicle as a function of time in minutes. And then the black points are showing you are vesicles without adenosine and the blue points are showing you vesicles with adenosine present. Now, if we zoom in on the first 10 minutes here, highlighted in yellow, that's shown here on the right hand side, you can see that there is no noticeable difference between the slopes of the lines with and without the adenosine present. So there's no overall effect of adenosine on the growth of vesicles. But let's take another example of a different molecule. And here we're looking at serine serine dipeptide. So serine is an amino acid, and this is basically two of them stuck together, as the chemical structure is shown here. So here again, the black points are showing you vesicles without serine serine, and red are showing you with serine serine. If we zoom in on these first 10 minutes highlighted here, you can see that the slope, the rate of growth of vesicles with serine serine present is significantly smaller than the rate of growth of vesicles without serine serine present. So there's a slower rate of growth due to the presence of this molecule. You might say, all right, well, that's two molecules, but you promised to tell me about the planetary environment as a whole, and there's probably going to be a lot more than two molecules around. And I would say, you are absolutely correct. So instead of two, how do you feel about 31 total? So again, there are probably many more than 31 molecules that could have been around for origins of life, but we tested a range of molecules in different categories and classes, including dipeptides, which are two amino acids stuck together, including some sugars as well, some amino acids, and some nucleobases, nucleosides. So what I'm showing you in this figure is the normalized initial rate of growth of vesicles, and then each individual molecule that we tested here is on the x-axis. So this 1.0 that is indicated by the dashed line indicates that there is no difference statistically in the rate of growth of vesicles in the presence of a given molecule um, versus without a molecule present. So most molecules do not affect vesicle growth significantly, and these are all of the molecules that are shown in black filled in points. However, we do find six molecules that do have statistically significantly different slopes or rates of growth than um, vesicles without a, an additional molecule present. These are all six dipeptides, and three of these dipeptides enhance the initial growth rate, shown here, and three of them slow the initial growth rate. So what is special about these dipeptides? Well, if we look at the three dipeptides that enhance the growth rate, they are listed right here, and you might notice something in common between all of them. That is that they all contain a leucine amino acid, which has the chemical structure pictured here. Whereas if we look at the three dipeptides that slow growth rate, two of the three all contain a serine amino acid. So then if we look at all the dipeptides that we tested that contain either a leucine or a serine, that's what I'm showing you in this figure here. So the left-hand side in this leftmost box are dipeptides that contain leucine, but no serine. And these of the six tested, we see three have an enhanced rate of growth and three have no substantial effect on the growth rate. So leucine is implicated in those dipeptides that have an enhanced growth rate, but simply having a leucine present does not for sure indicate that these dipeptides are going to enhance the rate of growth. And then similarly on the right-hand side, we're showing you the serine-containing dipeptides, and two of the three slow the initial growth rate, and one has no effect. And then interestingly, we have one that has both a serine and a leucine and find a decreased rate of growth here. So the, you can then begin to ask the next questions of, well, mechanistically, what is it about these dipeptides that cause these changes in rate of growth? You could also ask, well, are these observed changes in rate of growth going to be evolutionarily significant? Like, will they offer some sort of enhancement or competitiveness for the vesicles containing these molecules? And that is the study of future work. So overall conclusions from this project here is that we looked at the rate of growth of protocells in the presence of a wide variety of different chemicals, and we found that vesicles can grow robustly in the presence of different molecules, whereas a handful of those molecules offered an enhancement in the initial growth rate, and another handful of molecules slowed the initial growth rate. So implications of this going forward will be the investigation of future work, and again, this is just another step into piecing together this complex chemical environment that will be available 
on planets and understanding how you might be able to get continuously from the astronomical planetary environment available on planets to the synthesis of precursors and ultimately to the growth and division of protocells. So with that, I'd like to thank my co-authors on this project, um, everyone at NHFP, um, the leads and the organizing committee. You guys have all been wonderful. Um, it's been such a great program. And of course, my pony, Peter, always gets acknowledged as well. So with that, I would love to take any questions if you have them. All right, let's thank Zoe. Questions? Uh, hi, great talk. Um, I'd like to ask what um, bacteria were used for the selection of the dipeptides in the initial assay. Yeah, so why did we choose or why did we test these molecules here? Is that your question? Sorry, uh, yeah, like, what, yeah, yeah. Like, um, was, was there like some guiding principle as to why these in particular were selected, or was it just random? Yeah, so it's not just random. We wanted to stick to um, molecules that were prebiotically plausible. So previous studies had been done with, um, you know, molecules that are pretty highly unlikely to be available on the early Earth. So we stuck with those that are, there's a general consensus, are the most prebiotic. So those that are found in meteorites or that have prebiotic syntheses. And then we wanted to test a range of different properties. So some that are very hydrophobic or very water hating and some that are very water loving, um, some that are acidic, some that are basic to try to get a range of the potential effects here. Uh, because we clearly can't test everything. So the best we can do is test a range of things and hope that our results are somewhat generalizable. That was a wonderful question. I hope I answered it adequately. Hey Zoe, it's Mike Wong. Fantastic work as always. Um, getting back to the planetary environment, so you've identified these certain uh, dipeptides that enhance the growth of the, um, of, of the vesicles. Are there certain planetary environments in which leucine is created more or serine is created more? Yeah, so that's a wonderful question, and I really hope that that's where this work can kind of push us to go. Uh, so leucine is one of the more hydrophobic amino acids, so you might find it more in, like, organic rich places. So um, I don't know if this is true, but, like, an atmosphere like Titan, where you have lots of hydrocarbons, I could conceivably think that, hey, maybe that's a better place to get leucine present than uh you know, serine, which has lots of oxygen around, maybe you need to be in a more oxygenated atmosphere to get the synthesis of that molecule. And you could probably tell us more about that, Mike. Um, <laughs> but so that would be an initial guess as to how this work might be able to influence future studies along those lines. That was an awesome question. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, that is it for our time. Uh, let's thank Zoe again. to make sure that we are sharing the screen. All right, next up we have uh, Jake Turner, a uh, second fellow at uh, Cornell, who will be uh, telling us about um, magnetic fields and radio observations. So take it away, Jake. All right, thank you everybody. Thank you to everyone who presented so far and the organizers and everybody. So yeah, I will be talking about magnetic fields and explants today. So why, so to take a step back, basically, so from our solar system, if you look at our solar system, all the planets except for Venus had or has had a magnetic field sometime in the past, as well as the moon Ganymede. So we think this is quite a general thing that planets should have in terms of how they behave and evolve. And I have a, a schematic here of some of the, the solar system planets. There's quite a diversity of uh, magnetic field structures as well. So even with a small number of statistics, it's quite a complex uh, thing to think about. As well as brown dwarfs um, also have magnetic fields that have been detected for over uh, two decades now. And based off the solar system and brown dwarfs, uh, we believe from internal interior structure modeling as well as scaling laws that exoplanets should have magnetic fields as well. However, we have not conclusively detected them and uh, we're lots of people are searching for this. Uh, so why should we care, right? So people have been talking about atmospheres, talking about a lot of formation, uh, all kinds of different things in this talk uh, for exoplanets. So why should we care? So 
There's many different reasons. Uh, so one of the ones I think is the coolest one is actually interior structure. We can actually figure out what the interior structure of these exoplanets are if we detect the magnetic field. So for example, in Jupiter, we know there's metallic hydrogen. On Earth, we know there's a liquid iron core. This is actually done in our solar system for the gas giants originally to figure out what the interiors were like. So we can do this for, for exoplanets, because right now most of the things we know about exoplanets are their radius and mass, and there's very, a lot of degeneracies. So we can break that with the magnetic field. As well, we, we believe for hot Jupiters and ultra-hot Jupiters that the dynamics of the atmosphere will actually change if there's a, mag, uh, a magnetic field. So it can change winds, hot spots, stuff like that. So it actually could change some atmospheric effects. So okay, let's say you care about stars. So if some of these hot Jupiters are close, are so close to their heart, their star, that it, there could be magnetic effects between your star and your planet that actually cause your star to change uh, over time with star spots and other things. As well as we believe that uh, actually trying to form the planet in the first place, if the planet has a magnetic field versus not, it might actually cause differences in the formation and evolution. Uh, atmospheric escape, uh, we know this from our solar system, that if a planet does or does not have a magnetic field, that might influence its atmospheric escape. As well as everyone's uh, favorite one, we believe this might be one of the many aspects of habitability in terms of how life has formed on Earth and possibly other planets. So there's many reasons we should care. Why are there some ways to detect them? So people have been thinking about this for a while, and there's a review paper that tried to go through all the different ways to detect magnetic fields. Uh, I added an, a new one here um, from a recent paper. But basically, the, the gist of it is that radio observations are thought to be the best technique because they have the least uh, possibility of false positives, um, as well as this new technique using high-resolution helium polarization, uh, which I will briefly talk about at the end of my talk today. So there's a video. Let me see if this plays. Okay. Uh, so this video kind of shows you in our solar system how uh, the radio emission observations work. So we're actually observing electron cyclotron maser emission. Uh, and so basically stellar wind particles interact with the magnetosphere of the sol solar system planets and actually uh, follow the magnetic field lines of the planet and gyrate around the magnetic field lines and create radio emission. And then eventually that also actually creates the aurora. Um, so that's kind of like the very, yeah, if you will, that's so like this is looking at the stellar wind particles and, and how they interact with the magnetosphere. So if you look at the solar system planets, I show here actually uh, the radio spectrum from all the solar system planets. And the first thing that you will notice is that most of them can't actually be observed from the ground. So I have frequency versus flux. And basically at 10 megahertz, uh, you can't observe that from the, the ground. So you have to observe from space. So basically in the 1950s, we did detected Jupiter and the radio emission, and so we knew that Jupiter had a, a radio emission and also a magnetic field until we went to the space. We didn't know all the other planets could be observed in the radio, including Earth. Earth is naturally emitting these radio waves. And the most important thing from this graph, you see lots of structure, is that the maximum frequency we detect actually tells you the maximum frequency at the pole of the, of the planet. So this is kind of the, the holy grail. And so, so what you're actually observing is the gyro frequency of the radio emission at the local uh, magnetic field strength. So if you see it over uh, a wide variety of environments, you can actually figure out what the magnetic field is at the pole is. There's a lot of structure here that I don't think we'll ever be able to figure out for exoplanets, maybe, maybe not. Uh, and it tells you a lot about actually the, the what is actually causing the, the electrons. Um, for example, Jupiter actually has electrons both from Io and the solar wind. Uh, but there's some properties about ECMI. For example, it's 100% circularly polarized. Uh, we believe that the flux of the planets should be much greater than the star. This is the case for our solar system, as well as this is beamed emission. So it's going to be like a, a pulsar. So there's only some times when the beam is pointing towards Earth um, and away from it. I always like to show this because I'm not the first person to think about this. People have actually been observing since 1977 uh, in the radio, try to look for, for this emission. Uh, obviously, that was before exoplanets were known. Um, so there's a lot of observations. However, most of these observations were done at too high frequencies and, and not good enough sensitivity to put any constraints on models um, until pretty much most recently. So that's the main difference, as well as they didn't really observe over the whole orbital period of the planets and try to look for this beaming effect. So my observations, so I show here a picture of LOFAR. We actually only use the core of LOFAR, uh, which is on the bottom, uh, I guess, depending on the bottom there on the island. You can see it's on an island. And you can see a lot of different dots. Those are actually each individual stations. And the reason they built it on an island is because sheep kept on coming and, and breaking the telescope. Uh, this is actually a real picture of them when they were building LOFAR. Uh, anyway, so we got to worry about the sheep. 
Uh, and so they, uh, they fixed that problem, and this is also a ground view of the low frequency band, so you can see there are basically a bunch of antennas that we summed together. So we're observing from 16 to 73 megahertz, basically almost as low as you can go from the ground, and uh, we have really good sensitivity. Uh, we're observing in polarization. Uh, really good time and frequency resolution, not because that's going to be important for exoplanets, but that's going to be important uh, basically for getting rid of humans, radio frequency interference from humans. Uh, and we also observe with uh, one on beam and two off beams, and the two off beams are used to characterize uh, Earth's ionospheric effects as well as any instrumental effects. And so we always want to make sure that we're uh, cross correlating there between the two off beams of each other as well as the on beams. So this is what I presented last year was our first possible detection of an exoplanet in the radio from Tau Vu. So I show here both we have a slow emission detection, which is basically we sum over all time, and we, you can see pretty well that the on beam has a very distinct uh, difference between the two off beams. So we were quite excited about that. Uh, and then we also saw the same thing for burst emission, which is like one second bursts that we are very similar to what we see on Jupiter. We sum over them all time, and we see that there's a, a statistically significant difference between the off beams and the on beam. Uh, and this is at 3.2 sigma and 8.6 sigma. If I talked about this a lot last year, and there were some uncertainties of whether this was actually caused by the planet or an instrumental effect, so we actually need to confirm this. But if it is caused by the planet, we get a constraint of about 11 Gauss, which is consistent with um, theoretical modeling. So it was, it was quite an exciting detection. So we tried to follow this up to make sure it's real, uh, and, this, and this was very difficult to do. So what we were trying to do is we were trying to observe at the core of LOFAR, which is the Netherlands, NANUFAR, which is basically a new telescope um, that me and my colleagues have been working on, as well as UTR2 in Ukraine, as well as LWA in New Mexico. And so we tried observing it at the same time. Uh, there was about a two-hour overlap between LWA and the European telescopes. We tried observing at the same time over a wide uh, parameter space of the orbit. Uh, unfortunately, most of those observations that were simultaneous did not go according to plan. They saw various reasons, telescopes crashing, computers crashing, et cetera, et cetera, except we were actually able to get data from the Ukrainian telescope, uh, but unfortunately that data archive is now no longer available due to obvious reasons. So uh, I'm only going to be talking about LOFAR data today. And so this is showing the phase coverage that we had from our original observations. We only had about 25% of the or orbit, but the slow emission and the the burst emission were roughly around the same part of the orbit, which is actually what we expect, because we expect the beam to be pointed towards us. In other parts of the orbit, we didn't see anything. And so we tried getting more phases that we covered previously, as well as uh, the same phases multiple times to try to see if we see any periodicity. Um, unfortunately, we don't see a, a signal. So this is, again, showing the frequency integrated over all time uh, for on and off beams. And there is no statistically different uh, difference between the on beam and the off beams. Um, so we don't actually see uh, this, the same signal that we saw before, uh, which is kind of interesting and also, you know, not, not what we were going for, but also the same thing for the burst emission. So we, we look through the same data, we don't see anything. And so why is that the case? So e there's several reasons why we think this might be the case. Either original detection was actually an instrument, instrumental systematic that we still don't understand. We don't know where it's coming from. So that's the, the sad answer. We don't know if that's actually true or not. Or we're actually observing something that's been well known in the solar system since the 70s, um, stellar variability. So we know that what causes this radio emission is basically the stellar wind. And so I have a plot here of Earth showing this solar wind speed and the radio power of Earth. And basically, if your solar wind speed increases by a factor of two, you get actually a several orders of magnitude increase in the, the radio power. So this actually was an in-situ measurement, which I thought was really cool. We did the same thing at Saturn, uh, where we observed over time, and you can see the solar wind pressure, as well as the radio uh, emission, and they, they find a direct correlation of that as well. So we definitely think that this could be a problem, and this is actually well known in Tau Bu. Uh, so Tau Bu actually has a magnetic cycle of about eight months. Uh, it was previously thought about being about two years, but now that has been refined. And this is a prediction in 2015 showing that if you chose different uh, stellar wind conditions along the magnetic cycle of the star, you can get basically zero emission or you can get something that's an order, order of magnitude higher than that. Um, so we actually think the variability might be uh, on uh, the timescale of the magnetic cycle. And 
our, there were about three years between our two observations, so we actually think we might have been observing at different cycles. So in order to confirm that, the next steps in this research is basically uh, to use Nanufar, which is now commissioned, um, and we have guaranteed uh, time on this telescope every semester for about a 1,000 hours a semester. Uh, so we're going to actually try to follow up Taobu over its magnetic cycle and try to see if we see this on and off uh, characteristic based off its it's uh, it, the maximum and minimum stellar cycle. So hopefully we'll have some more insights on the next uh, uh, talk about that uh, next year. Uh, as well as we have a large targeted survey looking at dozens of other exoplanets. And so I, sh I show here some of the predictions. So this is frequency observed on Earth, flux density, all known exoplanets at the time. And I show several different sensitivity curves here. And we actually have a bunch of planets that are actually sensitive with Nanufar that we're not sensitive with LOFAR. So we're hopefully look at other planets as well. And then, you know, just the far future, we want to go to the moon. So what does that mean? So actually, the, the lessons that we learned from using LOFAR observations and NANUFAR observations can actually be directly applied to future moon-based missions, such as Lucy Knight, which I show here uh, an artist rendition of that, which is actually just one dipole that they're going to land on the far side of the moon. It's actually been funded. It's going to actually land in a few years. Um, that's going to be really useful for cosmology, not really for, well, useful for exoplanets. But the same technique can be used. Uh, and then also far side, which is, you know, a, a lot bigger telescope. And then you can see kind of 10 kilometers, many, many dishes. Uh, and so, you know, and I'm really interested in, in uh, far side because you, eventually you can actually study Earth-like planets at the same time, you know, James Webb is observing their atmospheres. So we can kind of get a holistic view. Uh, as well as just briefly, um, the, this is another project I've been working on as well to try to get a, a separate technique to discover magnetic fields. So there was a prediction in 2020 that if you look at the polarization and the helium line at high resolution, you can actually see a difference based off the magnetic field of the, of the planet. And so I tried observing with Spiru. They gave us six transits. And I've only actually successfully observed two of those, partly because of COVID, partly because of instrumental effects, telescope effects, weather, hurricanes, all these things. Uh, and uh, so we didn't quite get as much data as we wanted to, but we actually reproduce the helium line that has been seen in Stokes I that multiple telescopes have seen, so we're quite excited about that, as well as we just get random noise for the polarization, which I'm also really excited because we've been that down and actually there's no red noise in there. So hopefully if we get more transits, we might actually start to get some interesting constraints uh, with this technique. So stay tuned on that for, for next year as well. Uh, so this is my summary, and thank you for your time. Just thank you, Jake. Questions for Jake? Well, uh, it's actually a question about stars, I guess. Um, the, the winds from stars vary in, in both speed and density, um, and Yes or no, and are those things correlated or? Uh, yes, yes, and yes. So, uh, and as well as magnetic field strength, right? The magnetic field strength of the, the stars change over time as well. So, um, basically, if the pointing flux changes, so that could be either pressure, density, or magnetic field strength of the star, that will cause a change in the, the, the emission from the planet. Um, and so, we just want to actually observe that over the magnetic cycle and what. And from my point of view, I don't really care which one. Maybe people who study stars would care. Uh, I just want to actually get the, the actual uh, data from, the, from the, the planet. And again, it's a, the, the actual structure that we get in the frequency uh, plane and, uh, with flux depends on all these things you're talking about. But the actual maximum frequency we, we detect is correlated to the max, maximum magnetic field strength. So you can actually get a lot of information out. Because uh, the main thing I care about is the magnetic field, but if you actually do care about stellar winds and stuff like that, you can get a lot of information out from these observations. So I did have one question on the yes. NANOFAR observing uh, yes. program. Uh, like, which class of planets are you primarily targeting? Is it hot Jupiter systems or nearby M dwarfs or? Uh, so yeah, all of these are basically hot Jupiters because again. Uh, as I showed from the solar system, we still have this 10 megahertz limit. So most of the planets we're observing are hot Jupiters, but they're you know not the ones that are 
the closest ones from Earth or even their star, so we can kind of get at least a wide variety of, of hot Jupiters at least. And, and hopefully this, those, again, those lessons and any, any constraints when we get magnetic fields can be applied to the smaller planets. Yeah, that would be super, super awesome. All right, with that, uh, let's thank uh, Jake again and uh, all of the speakers of this session. Yeah, so Right, if you get an Earth magnet field and a minus seven, they're going to be able to Yeah, Right, but if you have something that's like basically one or like ten to four hundred, that's now in a detectable range of two of about like your actual Oh, awesome. So then, like, you detected in Stokes I? Which is the name of yours. Okay. You know, that's basically what everyone is doing. Okay. 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 So that's no. So we just uh, okay. But okay. Okay. Want to actually do that. So these are actually taking time. Okay. 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 Sure I didn't and then the scope Q is basically just random. Uh, so I mean, uh, we have more transits. We can stack them together. But I guess with this detection, are you able to then constrain the the, um, the magnetic field? Or uh, no, right now need we so actually we need all those transits. Okay. Very much a 3D effect. Yeah, yeah. So essentially, yeah. Uh, yeah. there are different yeah. angles um, yeah. of magnetic field perspective and kind of side field. Mm -hmm. So, uh, light and stuff right. too versus okay. yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. that's yeah. something that we're yeah. really yeah. using. Antonio is yeah. actually showing if you have the halo. Yeah, are you doing anything for oh. Unfortunately, we only get two. So, five. Five. Mm -hmm. uh, so so right now I think the interesting thing, right, is that this actually looks like random, which is quite amazing. I mean, the two little lines there and the sky is like all. I mean, we got rid of all the lines. We got rid of all the lines. Like, which is quite incredible. I, I was just like, really happy when I was like, wow, so uh, large uh, systematics. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, everywhere. Last and first name number. I'm hoping to get oh, more observation. Yeah, yeah. 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 definitely. Yeah. 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 I actually have to. Well, so this is all calibrated, right? So, I mean, what we really want in these observations is we want actually all three. Oh, what? Sorry? Oh yeah, go go for it. I'll <laughs> so, uh, this one basically, yeah, you actually need to write this over there. Really close. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's nice. That's, that's the problem my radio operation. Oh, my cell. The physical mechanism. Oh, yeah. Right. Well, these are the Yeah. No. Yeah, 
should just be over here and then it's I guess in your session are there gonna be remote and in person yeah. or both yeah. okay okay yeah. then you just have to uh, remember to uh, uh, after a remote speaker because then they had shared this screen so then you just have to make sure to <laughs> share the screen <laughs> Oh, yeah, the first no, the first speaker is going to be remote. I think other ones are right. There's a structure working out and how should I just I mean really we should have the When you change the one, you got to the other. Is there a way to do that? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Well, I guess desktop. it doesn't really matter. Yeah, can, you can just click on your, yeah, you can click on your, you should. I'll deal with it later. <laughs> sure. Cool. Should I keep it up or close it? I can, you can close it. Okay. Oh, nice. Um, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. I think I'm the only in person, right? Right. It's right. kind of You're funny. only in person, yeah. yeah. Oh, well.
Check if everything works. You wanna twice? No, oh, shouldn't. Should. <laughs> check. 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 Can you hear me, Catherine? Yeah, I can hear you. Do you want me to share? Sure, yeah, yeah, let's try sharing the screen and everything. So without the mic, you, you, you can't hear me, right? Correct. Okay, that's good to know. Are you able to see the slides? Yeah, we see the slides. Can you, um, let's see. Okay, let's do. All right. Um, okay, like that. All right. So yeah, I guess everything's working. Good. All right. We're going to start in two minutes. Okay. Sounds good. Cool. Thanks.
the Hi everyone, um, welcome to our second session of uh, today's symposium. So this session is gonna be devoted to compact objects and our first speaker is Catherine Nugent from Harvard University. So uh, Catherine, please uh, take it away. Okay, thank you. So hi, I'm Catherine Nugent and I just started as a Hubble Fellow at Harvard University a couple weeks ago. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, my PhD work and what I did for the last year and then what I hope to do as a postdoc at Harvard, specifically on red supergiant binaries on the path to becoming gravitational wave events. So first, what is a red supergiant? Why should we care about them? Why are they exciting? Um, so red supergiants are evolved massive stars that start out on the main sequence as 8 to 30 solar mass OB stars burning through their hydrogen. Stars that are less massive than 8 solar masses don't go through the whole massive star sequence. Stars that are more massive than 8 to 30, 30 solar masses generally evolve directly into wolf ray stars as opposed to going across the HR diagram and turning into red supergiants. So after these stars burn through their hydrogen, they start burning helium and very briefly pass through the yellow supergiant phase with lats only 10,000 years, maybe a little bit more. Um, stars like Polaris and Canopus are examples of yellow supergiants. And then once they have continued to expand and cool, they turn into stars that we've heard a lot about in the last couple of years, Betelgeuse and stars like Antares, which are red supergiants. And so these stars have temperatures on the order of 4,000 degrees Kelvin and have radii that are thousands of times that of our sun. And this is kind of the end of their stellar life before they go supernova and leave behind compact objects. Generally, red supergiants leave behind neutron stars as opposed to black holes because of their mass. Um, and this, Going supernova, leaving behind compact objects, is one of the reasons why we care about them. Um, so obviously the compact objects is exciting for gravitational wave astronomy, and then the going supernova and all of the heavy elements that get created in both of these processes um, are important for origin of solar system elements. So here this nice periodic table that shows that all of the green um, and orange uh, elements on this table come from massive stars. And so they're important to study, not just for stellar astrophysics, but kind of all across the board. And so why do we care in particular about binaries? And so a lot of people kind of hear or have it thrown around that all massive stars are in binary systems. And this is somewhat true, um, not quite, but I think it's maybe more appropriate to say that the vast majority of massive stars are either in a binary system now or experience kind of the effects of being in a binary system at some point throughout their lifetime. And so if you look at the unevolved OB stars, the stars that are still burning hydrogen, around 30 to 35% of them are in very tight, close interacting systems that are experiencing maybe Roche lobe overflow. Um, and then as you increase the separation, you get more and more of these stars in binary systems that maybe aren't interacting, but are still gravitationally bound. And so 70% or greater of um, these unevolved OB stars are currently in binary systems. And then kind of that remaining 30%-ish is they might experience the effects of binarity at some point in their life. And so, um, this obviously is important for gravitational wave astronomy because these unevolved OB stars might then later go supernova, leave behind compact objects that will merge. And so understanding these systems and kind of how they evolve throughout their lifetimes is important to determining how many gravitational wave events we expect to continue to detect in the future, especially with these new systems coming online. So why red supergiants? Kind of why did I chose or choose these objects? Um, and so the main reason is that when I first started looking at red supergiants a couple years ago, 
out of the tens of thousands of known red supergiants, there were only a dozen that were known to be in binary systems. So if we think that these are the direct progenitors to all of these gravitational wave events, or some of them, um, and we know that all of these unevolved OB stars are in binary systems, that many of them later turn into red supergiant systems, what happens to all of the binaries? And so this was kind of the question that I wanted to answer. You know, do they not exist or are we just not finding them because we haven't looked? And so I started off by trying to figure out what type of red or star would be in a binary system with a red supergiant and um, kind of quickly found that they're preferentially going to have these hot blue companions, so generally B stars. And so this comes because stars that are less massive than a B star will still generally be in the protostar phase because red supergiants themselves are massive, they're very short-lived. And stars that are more massive than a B star, like O stars, other evolved massive stars, are just incredibly rare due to um, the IMF, and then also they have very short lifetimes. So generally, if you're looking for a red supergiant that is in a binary system with a star, you're looking for a red star that has a bright blue companion. And so how do we find these systems? Um, if we think about photometry, red supergiants such as Betelgeuse are very red, B stars are very blue, so if you put them together, you're going to get something that is kind of yellow. And so here's a color color plot with U minus B on the X axis and R minus I on the Y axis. The red points are the, where the red supergiants would fall, a single red supergiants. The blue points are where the single B stars would fall. And then the black area is where you would expect to find these red supergiant B star binaries. So I went looking for stars that had colors like this to see if I could then find red supergiant binary systems and I found quite a few of them. And so looking in at the local group galaxies of M31, M33, and the Magellanic Clouds, I found over 250 new red supergiant B star binary systems. And so given that the original answer was a dozen, this is a huge increase, but more importantly tells us that it's just that we hadn't really done a devoted survey to try and look for these systems. They do exist, um, they are out there as we expected, we just hadn't found them yet. Um, and here is an example spectrum of a red supergiant B star binary, where you can see the titanium oxide bands from the red supergiant indicating the presence of a cool star, and then the upper Balmer lines down at around 4,000 angstroms um, indicating the presence of a very hot star. And so as part of this, I then looked at how the red supergiant binary fraction is and how it ranges in terms of the host environment. And I found that this number ranged between 15 to 40%. Um, and kind of in, instead of getting into why the range exists, I'd rather focus on just kind of the numbers of the range for this talk and point out that 15 to 40% uh, is a lot less than the kind of 100% that we all hear and think about for these unevolved OB stars. So these OB stars eventually, as I said, many of them turn into these red supergiant binary systems. So why does the number go from really, really high to kind of moderate, 15 to 40%? And so this is kind of what I'm thinking about from my postdoc work and then tying this into what this means for gravitational wave events. So to kind of step through why this is interesting and what might be happening, um, I have my dog, Meg, and my previous cat, Marlo, to help out. Um, and so if we have a system where one of the more evolved star has just started kind of burning through its helium, it is just starting to expand. We have two stars that are relatively separated. Um, as the cooler, more evolved star continues to cool down and expand, the red supergiant will grow closer and closer to its companion. And over time, there might be a little interaction where the B star is going through some sort of roche lobe overflow or comet envelope evolution with the red supergiant. And if they are close enough, then a merger will occur, and the red supergiant <laughs> will consume its companion B star. And so the takeaway from this is that it is very possible that mergers 
um, are incredibly important at kind of all areas of this massive star evolution. And so this can really drive down the binary fraction. And so while you're starting with a lot of unevolved OB stars in binary systems, by the time they evolve, make it across the HR diagram, um, mergers will actually greatly reduce the percentage of systems that are still in binary systems that could kind of turn into gravitational wave events. And so what does this mean, taking the animals out and looking at kind of other images um, and kind of elaborating a little more on the research behind this and then the importance of mergers. So if you start out with two OB stars in a binary system, like many OB stars do, um, if they are very close at this point, then a merger can occur here. We have seen this, um, we have seen evidence of this. They're rejuvenated um, B stars or blue stragglers, and so they have kind of different physical properties. Um, but if they are slightly more separated and the, um, you know, the more massive OB star is between 8 to 30 solar masses, it will evolve into a red supergiant, and so you get this red supergiant binary system, which was the focus of my thesis. Now, if these two stars are um, slightly closer together, um, then this interaction can occur. And so I have been looking for kind of observational signatures of this interaction. This implies that um, maybe they are going through Roche lobe overflow, about to go through common envelope evolution, um, and so you see this red supergiant that has a B star companion, but the B star has a disk around it because it has been sucking material off of the red supergiant. And so yes. I have found a bunch of these systems and am now kind of observing them over time to see how they change, to try and get a better sense of what their orbital dynamics are, as well as their physical properties, because these are, they should be the direct descendants to, um, you know, or the direct progenitors to gravitational wave events because they're very close, they're undergoing um, interaction while they're still stars. However, if they're a little bit closer, then you get kind of, it's a failed gravitational wave event, um, but exciting for stellar astrophysics, you get a merger. And so you get a red supergiant that maybe has um, at some point kind of um, engulfed its companion. And so also looking for these stars, a lot of the red supergiants out there that appear to be single should be the products of past merger events, um, depending on, you know, some point in their lifetime. And so looking at a large sample of apparently single red supergiants and trying to figure out how many of these have evidence of past merger events by looking at the abundances, the physical properties, the rotation rates, all of that good stuff um, is another big project for my postdoc that I have recently started on. Um, and then finally, if we assume that, you know, none of this exciting stuff happens, that the stars don't merge, the stars don't interact, um, kind of more the common systems where they're quite separated, um, the red supergiant will go supernova, leave behind a compact object, generally a neutron star, and then the second star will expand into a red supergiant. And so you'll get um, this red supergiant compact object system. And while radial velocity studies would be nice for finding these, I just wanted to quickly point out periods are very, very large. Um, so finding them with radial velocities is difficult. So this leads us to looking in the X-ray. And so kind of another thing I'm looking at is trying to find red supergiants that are X-ray bright. Um, and so with that, that is, here are my key takeaways um, that I can leave up and just kind of point out that these red supergiants should have B-type companions. We found a bunch of them. The binary fraction is lower than we expected, and this leads to exciting um, ways to characterize gravitational wave progenitors. So thank you, and with that, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Catherine. Hey, Catherine, great talk. I'm, I'm interested a little bit in, in the observational signatures of the mergers um, rotation and chemistry, for instance. Can you talk a little bit about what's the most promising um, observational signatures and maybe some of the difficulties in obtaining those measurements? Definitely. Um, so one 
that has been actually done before is it's been at least hypothesized that Betelgeuse is a um, past mer is a current merger remnant um, from a much lower mass star. And so Betelgeuse is rotating a lot faster than expected. And so red supergiants generally should be in the kind of five to 10 kilometer per second range for rotation rates and Betelgeuse is up at 15. Um, and so this is what kind of got me thinking about it is I read a paper about that and thought, oh, that'd be really cool. Why don't I just look at rotation rates? Um, and this was before I had really learned, I, I'm used to looking at rotation rates of OB stars that are on the order of hundreds of kilometers per second. So it's really easy to measure. Um, when you get down, as many of you know, in the really low rotation rate category, you have micro turbulence, macro turbulence, all of these other fun things that come into play. And so actually just measuring the rotation rate and kind of getting it um, separated from the micro and macro turbulence is really difficult, and that's what I've been working on now. Um, there's a lot of work that has gone into looking at more uh, giants, red giants, and even solar type stars for this, but not as much for red supergiants. Um, and then in terms of abundances, there's just so many different things that can happen to a red supergiant that would cause weird abundances that um, I'm right now trying to take a very global approach and try and figure out just if we can identify stars that are different in some way and then tie that back to maybe a merger as opposed to knowing exactly what to look for. There are you know, some heavy elements that we might be excited to detect, but there are also other things that could produce those. And so I'm hoping that a combination of rotation rates, maybe higher um, luminosities, slightly different temperatures, maybe slightly higher temperatures, and then in combination with the abundances would lead us to finding a sample. Thank you, Catherine. I think that uh, we don't have uh, much time for more questions. Maybe we can leave them, um, you know, for for an offline discussion. Um, so let's thank uh, Catherine again. And our next speaker is Thankful uh, Kramarti from uh, uh, from Cornell, I remember. And uh, um, so she's going to. Uh, talk about the binary millisecond pulsar mass measurements from the Nanograph 15 year uh, data set. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Cool. Hi, everyone. My name is Thankful Cromarty. I'm a third year Einstein Fellow at Cornell. Uh, and today I'd like to talk to you, as always, about pulsar timing arrays and uh, mass measurements for neutron stars. Um, the first thing I wanted to just say is that this is my last symposium. Um, I, I never would have thought that I would have the opportunity to have a fellowship like this, and I'm so, so grateful, or thankful, I guess. Um, so thank you to the leads, thank you to the program. It, it's been awesome. So. Um, okay, cool, we're gonna speed through an introduction to millisecond pulsars. So these are rapidly rotating, highly magnetized neutron stars. They beam radiation out of their magnetic axes, and they spin. So when the beam crosses across your line of sight, uh, you see it as sort of a pulsating signal. So they don't actually pulse, but they're like lighthouses instead. So they're city-sized-ish. Uh, they have masses between one-ish and two-ish solar masses, but we're going to talk about that later. Um, you know, millisecond pulsars are these special class of pulsars that have been spun up. Uh, by accreting matter from a companion, um, and so they're extremely rapidly rotating, and they're very stable rotators as well. So we know of about 400 millisecond pulsars. They're like 4,000-ish uh, normal pulsars, uh, and they're usually observed at very low radio frequencies. We can also uh, look at them in gamma rays and x-rays, um, but you think of these objects as, as low-frequency radio objects. Okay, so one really cool thing we can do with pulsars uh, is do pulsar timing. So an extreme simplification of what this is, is it is the process of creating a model that can account for each and every rotation of a pulsar, right? And so you create this model that uh, takes into account dispersion from the ISM, uh, general relativistic effects, uh, ephemerities, binary parameters, all these things. Uh, and you have some model where you get every little time of arrival measurement, right, for each pulse. 
And the difference between what your model predicted, what you got, uh, are these timing residuals that you can see. So if you leave out a parameter, like prop promotion, kind of important, uh, you will see that effect propagating. You'll see structure in your residuals. And so these, uh, the precision rivals that of atom atomic clocks. It's really phenomenal. Um, you can see here that this folded pulse on top uh, is about a thousand times as wide as the actual precision with which we can measure the pulse. Okay, pulsar timing arrays. Another cool application of pulsar timing, so you probably know this figure well. Uh, at this very high frequency, low strain end, you have uh, LIGO sources. So these are tens or, you know, solar mass, black hole, uh, neutron star type mergers. Um, at this extreme low frequency end, you have pulsar timing arrays. And so it turns out that uh, the sources that we're sensitive to in this band are uh, in spirals of supermassive black hole binaries. So the idea here is that we can time a bunch of millisecond pulsars all across the sky to extremely high precision. The gravitational waves are going to, you know, stretch and squeeze space time between the Earth and the pulsar and create these tiny deviations in the timing residuals. And so those deviations are correlated. Uh, it is a quadrupolar correlation and or signal, and, and so we call this the Hellings and Downs curve. It's the arrival time correlation as a function of angles between pulsar pairs. Um, and so basically what you end up having is a detector that is galactic scale, right? So, so the pulsars themselves are our detector, and we detect our detector with large radio telescopes. Okay, so Nanograph uh, is a pulsar timing array experiment. It's the North American Nanohertz Observatory for Gravitational Waves. Uh, we use several different large radio telescopes, including the GBT in West Virginia, uh, the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment, and the Very Large Array. Uh, we were, you know, very frequent users. We were very reliant on Arecibo until we tragically lost it um, a couple years ago now. Uh, but we have changed our observing program around to sort of compensate for this loss. I can talk about that more if anyone's interested. Um, so yes, yeah, so you have the North American Nanohertz Observatory for Gravitational Waves, which is part of this larger consortium called the International Pulsar Timing Array. So we have collaborators in Europe and China, India, Australia, Africa. Um, truly amazing collaboration. And the idea here is that we can just pull our, you know, pull our data sets together and increase our sensitivity to gravitational waves uh, substantially. And I'll say just one thing. I mean, I, the main signal, sort of the first signal that we expect to detect is a stochastic background of gravitational waves, right? With time, we'll become sensitive to uh, individual binaries. Um, but for now, sort of our, our main signal of interest is the stochastic background. So an ensemble of a bunch of different mergers all over the universe. OK, so some recent results. Um, I'm going to speed through this. It's far too interesting to, you know, confined to a minute or whatever. But uh, the, the great news is that Nanograv and the European Pulsar Timing Array and the Parkes Pulsar Timing Array, as well as the International Pulsar Timing Array data set, are all showing signs of this common red noise process with a similar amplitude and spectral index in all of our pulsars. And so what this means, I mean, I think the takeaway here is that this is what we expect on the way to being able to detect the spatial correlation spatial correlations. And so the spatial correlations are going to be sort of the uh, smoking gun of a detection of the background. Um, but this is a really, really good start. And it's precisely what we expect. Um, one of the cool things about, about gravitational wave detection is that we know that the signal is quadrupolar. And, and so we can sort of rule out uh, that, you know, monopolar or dipolar signals, so things like uh, clock errors or problems with solar system ephemerities are, are causing this common red noise process that we see. Uh, those are strongly disfavored. And so we are working on our next data set. Uh, these uh, results are from last year. Um, I, I can't say anything. <laughs> I'm really sorry about this. I really wish I could say something. Um, but our analyses are going really well. So that's, that's all I'm allowed to say. OK, so what have I actually been doing, though? Um, working on the 15-year data set, mostly, for Nanograv. Uh, we've added 21 new millisecond pulsars, uh, which is a substantial increase from the last data set. Um, we've been working on both a narrow band and a wide band data set. And basically, without going into too much nitty gritty, this means that uh, the way we extract the TOAs is with, a, you know, instead of using this one dimensional template that we would usually use, um, we are using a template that evolves with frequency. And we, we know that that's sort of necessary because over large bandwidths, uh, the, the pulsar shape, the pulse shape is going to evolve. 
And so in order to really uh, do a good job of extracting time of arrival measurements, this is really the right thing to do. Okay, uh, and the other reason it's important is because we're starting to move into this era of sort of ultra-wideband measurements. The ultra-wideband receiver is going on the GPT next month, probably. Um, and so this, you know, for the 12 and a half year data set caused a uh, 33 time reduction in data volume, which is really critical, and it's just gonna become more and more important with time. Uh, we've been working on our pulsar timing pipeline, which has been a lot of work, but really fun to develop been thinking of ways to make it more uh, kind of accessible to students and, and non-experts. Um, it's going to be made public soon, so, you know, look out for that, I guess. Um, I've been investigating some top secret problems that I also can't, uh, can't discuss, but it's been extremely interesting and fun. Um, and what I'm going to talk about in the last part of the talk is measuring pulsar masses uh, from the data set. And the other thing I've been doing is thinking about sort of these measurement techniques and how robust they are. Um, there's been a lot of discussion around this, around how we measure neutron star masses, um, so I'll, I'll get into that a little bit. The other thing is developing new pulsar timing software. This has been a, a big effort led by um, that many people, uh, and that's been a very interesting experience as well. Um, yeah, I, I can't really get into details, but it's called Pint, if anyone's interested in looking into it. Um, and then I also led a FAST campaign, which was incredible to have gotten time on that amazing instrument. I, I don't know that this plot will mean a lot to, to a bunch of people, but it, it's beautiful. It's really hard to explain how beautiful this data is. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. The pulse profile is just, it looks really good. I'll, I'll say that. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Shapiro delay. Why, why do neutron star masses matter? I think we know this. Uh, the equation of state of the interior of neutron stars is not very well understood. Um, but all of these different propositions for the equation of state can be translated into observables, right? Into kind of this relationship between mass and radius. And this means that if we can just measure more and more massive neutron stars, then we can very easily kind of naively put a limit on, you know, constraining the, we can constrain the equation of state quite easily. Um, and so this is something that I'm extremely interested in continuing to do. The reason it matters, radio measurements have been uh, really important for informing other studies of neutron star masses. So, um, you know, modeling, for example, by the, the nicer X-ray collaboration, um, they can use our radio timing measurements to put priors on their models, and, and this kind of synergistic analysis has now proven uh, on several different occasions to make a very big difference. So this has been really exciting. Okay, so the main uh, technique we use is Shapiro delay. Um, this is just one of uh, several different post-capillarian parameters that you can use to kind of uh, independently measure the mass of the, of the pulsar and the companion. Um, you know, if you only have the sort of classical uh, capillarian parameters, then you can't uh, distinguish between the mass of the companion and the mass of the pulsar itself. So uh, this is only doable in a, in a small subset of systems. Um, yeah, so I won't say too much more. You can see that Shapiro delay is extremely dependent on inclination angle because this is happening when the pulsar goes behind its companion. Uh, the, the potential of the companion causes a longer travel time, right, and the pulse is going to arrive late. Um, so this is kind of amazing how, how necessary it is to, to see Shapiro delay in extremely inclined uh, orbits. Okay, this is a proven strategy for nanograv. Uh, two of, you know, sort of these very notable uh, massive neutron stars were able to be measured very precisely because of the high cadence of nanograv's observing. Uh, 0740 plus 6620 is still currently the most massive well-measured uh, neutron star that we know of. Um, the kind of first famous two solar mass neutron star was uh, 1614. That's from Demarest et al. on the right. Um, so we know that measuring masses in nanograv data, uh, it, it's a, you know, it's a really amazing kind of secondary science thing to be able to do. So these are <laughs> super preliminary results, and I don't actually really need you to, to look at these plots. Um, the takeaway is just that Comparing the uh, kind of binary parameter measurements between the 12 and a half and 15 year data set is not revealing anything particularly scary. There are some, you know, multiple sigma deviations between the data sets, but in every case, we can attribute that to sort of changes in the model or, or other issues. Um, so there's nothing very startling, but there are some cool things. 
including, yeah, sorry, I know, I'm out, um, including uh, the measurement of a potentially very massive neutron star. Um, these are all plots of the companion mass uh, versus the inclination angle, so we're just grading over those two parameters, which are what we're actually fitting for. Um, so we have some new significant measurements of, of uh, the mass of some of these nanograph pulsars, um, some really precise, uh, significant improvements. Um, you can see the precision to which we're, we're measuring some of these masses. And then uh, you can see um, with 1630 uh, that Obviously, it's not a 6.3 solar mass neutron star. Um, but this is very interesting because this is sort of the pattern that we saw with 0740 as well. It's the reason why we started observing it uh, in this very targeted way. So, you know, we're hoping that this might end up being another kind of heavyish neutron star. That'd be very cool. Um, but we obviously have a long way to go in terms of improving the precision. Um, and we have a targeted campaign that ran at the beginning of this year at the GBT. Uh, to measure, um, to follow up on some of these uh, mass measurements, do some targeted observations, um, and we are working on analy analyzing those data now. Um, so we, we are seeing that nanograv is really great for these neutron star mass, me mass measurements. Um, we will possibly be publishing these. Obviously, some of it will be, uh, you know, in the main paper, in the main data release paper. There might also be a supplementary paper, so look out for that. Uh, at the beginning of next year, next spring. So that's all I've got. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions? Um, so in this sample of new uh, parameters for these binaries, uh, are there any new types of exotic neutron star binaries, you know, that companions that we haven't seen before, you know? Black hole, maybe? <laughs> oh, I, I wish. <laughs> that, that would rock. Um, so part of the problem here is that nanograv selects for sort of, or, you know, pulsar timing array experiments in general select for kind of the most predictable, <laughs> boring sorts of, sorts of systems. And so um, there's been a lot of interesting work in kind of searching for new pulsars that I've also been involved with that's turned up some, you know, massive com companions, some, some more massive neutron stars. Um, but in terms of the new measurements from the nanograph data set, uh, we're, we're sort of selecting against that anyway. So, um, yeah, we, we sometimes include these so-called spider pulsars, these very highly accelerated systems, but even then uh, those kinds of have their own complications, and so we sort of avoid them. But, yeah, I... Fingers crossed. More questions? I actually had a question myself. So sure. at some point um, you were discussing the constraints on the equation of state of neutron stars. Mm -hmm. So can you compare those with the ones coming from the gravitational wave mergers? Like are they competitive or they probe different parameter space? Maybe. Yeah, so, so the gravitational wave constraints um, are obviously uh, coming from a totally different place, right, from tidal deformation instead of just from putting a nice, like, cap on the mass. Um, I think that the upper limits from gravitational wave uh, analyses are consistent. The last, I, it's like 2.17 or something, I think that's been updated, but um, it, it's completely consistent with what we're seeing. It's just kind of putting a different, uh, a different constraint on the parameter space. Um, so th th I don't think that there's any really scary tension or anything like that. Um, there, I have an extra slide about it. There, there was recently a paper about um, a two, possible 2.35 solar mass neutron star, but the, um, not to sound like I'm dissing it, it's just a totally different measurement technique, um, and, and they'll need to kind of improve the precision of that measurement, because the one sigma error bars are like 0.17 solar masses. Um, so that'll be really interesting to follow with time as we get, uh, you know, sort of new instruments. Um, but they're measuring the, the companion spectroscopically and, and photometrically. So. Very good. Let's thank uh, thankful again. Thanks. Our next speaker is going to be um, uh, Tarindu uh, J. Sinch from Berkeley. So Tarindu, uh, can you... Can you hear us well? Yes. yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Perfect. So, um, can you start sharing your slides? Yes. Um,
can you see my uh, PowerPoint? Uh, yes. Um, All right. Please uh, take it away. All right. So good morning, everyone. My name is Tarindu Jaisingha. I'm a first year Hubble fellow at UC Berkeley, and I'm very excited to be talking to you about my work today. So I'm also part of the Assassin collaboration. Um, today, I will be talking to you about a search for non-interacting compact object binaries with Gaia, Assassin, and Tess. All right. So our story starts with massive stars in the Milky Way. Massive stars play a crucial role in the nucleosynthesis and structure of interstellar medium and galaxies and also contribute significantly to their, uh, to their uh, life strength. So while they are important in many ways, they are short lived with main sequence lifetimes on the order of a million to a few tens of millions of years. On an astronomical time scale though, they evolve and quite literally go out in the, bang, in the blink of an eye. So one of my favorite images of massive stars doing exciting things is this panel from Adams et al. 2016, showing the disappearance of a massive star in the galaxy NGC 6946. So it is thought that the star underwent a failed supernova event, brightening momentarily before it disappeared from optical view. The current hypothesis is that the massive star underwent a co-collapse event, resulting in the formation of a stellar mass black hole. So as these massive stars evolve and die, they leave behind compact stellar remnants all over the galaxy. Uh, these compact objects include neutron stars and black holes, as we uh, heard about a lot recently. So to put some numbers into context, there are about 10 to the 9 neutron stars and about 10 to the 8 black holes scattered all over the Milky Way. So some of these compact objects are relatively easy to find. Oh, sorry. Yeah, some black holes and neutron stars are relatively easy to find. And these discoveries have come from X-ray binaries, uh, so they, these are bright X-ray beacons that are promptly identified using X-ray telescopes. Other discoveries have come from pulsars that are discovered in radio observations, as thankful just mentioned. And more recently, uh, merging compact objects have been identified through gravitational wave observations from LIGO and Virgo. So, however, we have barely touched the surface when it comes to the discovery of these compact objects. As illustrated using this image of an iceberg, uh, our current consensus of uh, compact objects is a biased sample. This is because our sample contains only uh, binaries that cover a narrow range of uh, parameter space in orbital properties, for example. To put things into context, uh, there are a few tens of known stellar mass black holes in the Milky Way out of an expected 10 to the 8. So what we are really seeing here is the tip of the tip of the iceberg uh, of compact objects in our galaxy. Clearly, there are a lot of discoveries of non-interacting compact objects that can be made, which will enable us to understand the formation and distribution of these compact objects in the Milky Way. Uh, the problem here is that non-interacting compact objects are much more difficult to find, but they must be discovered and characterized in order to understand the numbers, the evolutionary pathways, and the formation mechanisms of the interacting systems. So what is our goal with this project? Uh, one of the biggest goals in searching for these non-interacting compact objects is to know more about their mass distribution. Using black hole mass measurements from LIGO and X-ray binaries, we can already place constraints on the overall mass distribution of these compact objects. This excellent plot from the LIGO collaboration illustrates the masses of compact objects from both electromagnetic discoveries and gravitational wave discoveries. The results from LIGO and Virgo have contributed significantly towards our understanding of compact object masses. For example, we have made many discoveries of high mass stellar black holes uh, thanks to LIGO. The top right panel from Theory and Fairhurst shows the component mass distribution from gravitational wave events, and the bottom left panel shows uh, the mass distribution of black holes in X ray binaries. However, as I mentioned before, uh, this sample of compact objects is biased and a little incomplete. So we really need to find these non-interacting compact objects in order to better understand and constrain the compact object mass distribution. A more complete sample of black holes will provide constraints on the black hole mass function, supernova explosion physics, and the evolutionary paths of binaries following supernovae. So we know that there are a lot of compact uh, objects in non-interacting binaries, uh, but how do we go about trying to find them? The discovery space of non-interacting compact objects is opened up by radial velocity searches, or sky photometric surveys, and astrometric surveys that provide information on the binary orbits for a very large number of stars. 
one can go on and on about each of these three methods, but for my talk today, I will focus on the radial velocity method and the photometry method to search for non interacting compact objects. So, uh, in like a few months ago, uh, Gaia DR3 came out with this awesome new data release containing a treasure store probe of data for more than a billion Milky Way stars. Gaia is a remarkable telescope and it has revolutionized stellar astronomy for the last few years. So the question is, can we use Gaia to find non-interacting compact objects? Absolutely. Gaia collects radial velocities, photometry, and astrometry, and allows us to derive orbits for binaries, like on the order of hundreds of thousands of binaries. So it is a perfect instrument to try and search for non-interacting compact objects. In fact, on the archive today, there was the detection of the first Gaia uh, detected black hole from astrometry. So exciting things are abound for this field. So in the work I will talk to you about next, uh, we set out to use this brand new Gaia data release, uh, particularly focusing on the catalog of single line spectroscopic binaries to find black holes and neutron stars in binaries around stars in the Milky Way. So how did we do this? Um, so Gaia released a catalog of single line spectroscopic binaries containing about 181,000 orbits. Single line spectroscopic binaries, or SB1s, uh, for short, are uh, binaries where the spectrum only contains a single set of absorption lines. Uh, using the Gaia spectroscopic orbits, we can determine the binary mass function for these binaries. This is essentially the minimum mass of a binary companion. And these plots show the, the distribution of orbital periods, mass functions, eccentricities, and the significance or single to noise of these uh, orbits. The Gaia catalog includes binaries covering a large range of periods, mass functions, eccentricities, and signal noise. To identify non-interacting compact objects and binaries, we select the systems with high mass functions and high signal noise for further vetting. So this is work that I did with a wonderful graduate student, Dominic Rowan, and my assassin collaborators at Ohio State. So this plot is an extinction collected Gaia color magnitude diagram showing all the SB1s with the points colored by the binary mass function. The missed isochrones are shown here for reference. And our set of candidates are shown by these larger black dots. The key takeaway from this plot is that our candidates cover a wide set of evolutionary states. There are some on the main sequence, but most appear to be evolved systems. Next, we vetted these uh, candidates using light curves from Assassin and TESS. Light curves provide useful information that we can use to complement the spectroscopic observations from Gaia. Uh, for example, we can identify eclipsing binaries which are a false positive and then remove them from the list. Here I have shown three five different examples. Uh, sorry, five minutes? Yes. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, the key thing is uh, the Leftmost example here I've shown is an eclipse in binary, which is a false positive. So we found 31 of these systems and we were able to remove that from the list. And on the middle, uh, I've shown an example of an ellipsoidal variable. These are useful systems because we can model the light curves and derive the binary mass ratio and the inclination. And with that, we can determine the individual masses of the two components in the binary. Finally, I have shown an example of an ellipsoidal variable that is also an eclipse in binary. On the top panel, which I show the assassin data, and it looks like an ellipsoidal variable. However, when the additional precision of the test data, we are able to see that this is actually an eclipse in binary. So we were able to remove that as a false positive. All in all, uh, we were able to clean up our list of eclipse in binaries using that curve wedding. So after the wedding process, we have about 80 candidates. And uh, most of these are very bright, so we are able to follow them up from the ground. And these two plots here show the orbital periods and the mass functions of our uh, candidates. Most of the candidates have periods in the order of a few days to a few hundreds of days. And some of them also appear to have very large mass functions, which is good. However, uh, we still need to do a lot of work to confirm and vet these candidates. Uh, they, what we're doing right now is the first step. Uh, and uh, the method to do this is actually to use multi-wavelength follow-up and this is work that I'm actually involved in right now. For example, this might include getting UV observations to rule out hot main sequence companions to systems with red giants or to get high resolution optical spectra to characterize the, uh, the stellar component. And we started to do some of this uh, with uh, the Gaia data. 
And what we see here are two color magnitude diagrams. On the left, I've shown the optical Gaia color magnitude diagram. And on the right, I've shown the two mass near infrared color magnitude diagram. So uh, I want to focus on this Hertzsprung gap, which I've highlighted in the yellow box. So on the Gaia optical color magnitude diagram, you see that there are a bunch of our candidates in the Hertzsprung gap, where very few stars should exist. And then when you compare that to the near infrared CMD, most of the candidates have shifted redward and they are on the red giant branch. So what does this mean? So this means that we are finding a lot of false positives that are stellar binaries, which include a hot component and a cool component. So the blended SEDs of these stellar binaries make them appear to have intermediate colors and that makes them fall on the Hertzsprung gap. So looking at the CMDs are also a very useful technique to wet our list and remove false positives. And another thing we can do with Gaia is to look at the high resolution RVS spectra to identify false positives. So unfortunately, not all of our candidates had publicly available RVS spectra, but with the uh, systems that had RVS spectra, we were able to look at them and use them to rule out stellar binaries. So to do that, we used this hydrogen feature at 860 nanometers, which is sensitive to the effective temperature. Uh, so it has increasing line width uh, and line depth with increasing effective temperature. And we were able to use this to identify binaries with a hot and cold component. So the two uh, spectra I've shown on the top were false positives. They were systems with a hot component and a red giant, and we were able to rule them out. And on the bottom, we see a nice spectrum without that absorption line corresponding to an isolated main sequence star. One minute. Yeah. So what is next? Uh, this work is just the start. And it's a very useful starting point for me as I begin my fellowship. While we have not identified any strong or obvious black holes among these SP1 systems in Gaia, uh, there's a lot of work to do to vet our candidates, to get more follow-up data, and hopefully to find a couple of interesting systems. Uh, so, yeah, for example, what we can do next is to model the SEDs and use that to determine whether the SED is best represented with a single star or a binary. And then we can obtain high resolution spectra to really see if we can find evidence of a second set of absorption lines and see if the system is actually an SB1. And we can also obtain swift Uri photometry for red systems to rule out blue main sequence companions. And of course, it's always interesting to obtain X-rays to see the X-ray emission from our targets. So with that, I will end my talk and leave this slide with the key takeaways from the search, and I will take questions. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Sarindo. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Yes, Paul. Thanks, that's uh, super interesting. Um, I'm just wondering uh, about uh, astrometric data in Gaia being used to, to find binaries. Is that yeah, something that's you've considered or, or about looking at? Yeah, that's a great question. Absolutely. So uh, there are a lot of teams working uh, independently of us right now trying to do this. Um, so uh, just today there was, the, as I mentioned before, the first ast astromatic detection of a binary black hole in, uh, sorry, a black hole in a binary with a sun-like star. So I'm definitely interested in looking at the astromatic data. Uh, my expertise with uh, doing things in grad school was to look at uh, RH velocities. So I will definitely poke around the astrometry and see if there are interesting systems that we can follow up. The, the Gaia data is kind of amazing. There's a lot we can do. Any more questions? If not, let's uh, thank uh, Tarindu again. Okay. And our next speaker is Ariadna Murjie Bertier from uh, Northwestern. Hi, thank you very much. Um, let me see. Can you see my screen and my presentation? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, thank you very much. So thank you very much for everything. And today I'll be talking about how the jet structure from GW 170817 can tell us about the intrinsic properties of the merger. So first of all, I want to apologize for not being there, but also not sorry. I'm taking care of this cutie pie right here. So I'm extremely happy and sleep deprived. So if I say something incorrect, that's why. So first of all, as you all know, around four years ago, well, around a lot of years ago, LIGO found the first binary neutron star that was associated with an electromagnetic counterpart called GW170817. 
So let me explain what happened for this binary neutron star merger. So first of all, we have two neutron stars that are orbiting around each other. They are getting closer because they are radiating gravitational waves. As they get closer, they become dynamically unstable. And they, they, there's material that becomes unbound and is ejected through the outer Lagrangian points. Now, this merger is going to result in this hot hypermassive neutron star that's differentially rotating. And that is also going to be surrounded by an accretion disk. After a certain delay time, the hypermassive neutron star is going to go into uniform rotation and it's going to collapse into a black hole. So the end result is going to be a black hole surrounded by an accretion disk. From there, what's going to happen is that magnetic stresses are going to bring material from the accretion disk onto the black hole, which will drive a relativistic jet that the jet will interact with the medium. And we're also going to observe a gamma ray burst. So this is what we observed for GW170817 and what we think happened. And in particular, for the case of GW170817, after lots of work, we have found that if we want to explain the observations, what we need is to observe the gamma ray burst off axis. So instead of looking at the jet directly, we're actually going to be looking at it a little bit off axis. And not only that, but what we need is that the jet is not going to be collimated. We need what's called a structured jet, or we need the jet to have a large amount of energy at larger angles, basically have a structure. So then the question arises, how can we form this jet? How can we form this structure? And what I'm going to talk about for the rest of this talk is how to do this with having the jet interact with several winds from before the merger. So again, one way in which we can produce a structured jet is by having the jet interact with the ambient medium. As the jet interacts with different winds or the medium around it, what's going to happen is that the jet encounters the wind and the head of the jet is going to become decelerated. If we balance the ramp pressure of the jet and the wind medium, we can calculate the velocity of the head of the jet. And I'm sorry for this equation. It actually does not matter. The only thing that matters is this parameter called L tilde, which just basically tells you that the velocity of the head of the jet depends on the density of the medium and the density of the jet, which is not at all surprising. What's also going to happen is that as the jet plows through the medium, excess material is going to be accumulated in this cocoon right here. And everything, if the jet is powerful enough, the jet can break through the wind and it will emerge out relativistically. Now, all this interaction with the medium is going to shape the jet and it's going to give it structure. So now that we know that the ambient medium will shape the jet, let me discuss some mass loss mechanisms expected during the merger that can shape the jet. Because not only will it interact with the ambient medium, but it will also interact with several winds. So during the hypermassive neutron star phase in particular, there's going to be a lot of neutrinos being formed due to the beta process. These neutrinos will interact with the matter around their star, and they're going to, they're going to drive this wind, which is known as the neutrino-driven wind. It, th this wind is very important because it typically lasts for the duration of the hypermassive neutron star. So this is actually related to the delay time between the merger and the collapse to a black hole. Now I cannot stress how important this number is enough because this number will actually tell us about the equation of state of the neutron star, this delay time of collapse and the lifetime of the hypermassive neutron star. So constraining this delay time is extremely important to understanding the equation of state of the neutron star. And of course, this is some of the work that we have done in the past, trying right, to constrain this delay time. So what did we do and how did we constrain the this, this delay time? So we simulated how the jet interacts with different winds with special relativistic hydrodynamical simulations with a code called Mescal. So what we did first is we put a, just a wind. It could be spherical. It could be the neutrino driven wind taken from global simulations. After a certain delay time that I'm going to call TW, the jet is launched. Now this TW, in the case of the neutrino driven wind, again, is the delay time between the, the merger itself and the collapse to a black hole or the lifetime of the hypermassive neutron star. So the W is the, the, the thing that we want to constrain. And after that, the jet is launched and it lasts for a time that I'm going to call T-jet. Now, this is how our simulation looks like. What I'm showing here is a movie of the density and a movie of the Lorentz factor. This white bar is just a distance scale of 1.5 C. And I'm just going to play the movie. And what I want you to notice is, first of all, that as the jet plows through the wind, it loses its initial top hat feature. And it actually has this wing-like structure, 
So it be basically becomes a structured jet. Now let me go, let me walk through what happens in all the stages of this movie, in all the stages of this interaction. So initially, this well, what I'm showing right here is the density at different times, and these are Lorentz factor contour plots. This is just the, the distance scale. So initially, as the jet interacts with the medium, the velocity of the head of the jet is just related to this L tilde factor that I talked about before, which is just related again to the density of the medium and the density of the jet. But after some time, the cocoon is going to be formed and the cocoon will exert pressure on the jet. This, then a recollimation shock is going to start to form and now we enter a different regime. So the velocity of the head of the jet will now have a different form. So L tilde will now depend on the pressure of the cocoon. So this will actually accelerate the jet. After it breaks from the wind, there is a steep decline in the density and the jet is accelerated at very high Lorentz factors. And this is all shown right here. So here I'm just showing the position of the head of the jet as a function of time. The purple line represents the results from our simulations. Here is where the break from the wind happens. And the dashed line represents our analytical estimates for these three different regimes. So this is just the initial regime. This is where the, the where we have the collimated regime or the where, where the cocoon actually matters. And this is just outside the wind. So as you can see, we have a pretty clear understanding of what, what's going on in our simulations, which is pretty nice. And we have these three regimes. Now, what can happen? So as the jet interacts with the wind, three different things can happen. Imagine that, for example, the jet is not powerful enough or the medium is just extremely dense. Then what's going to happen is that the jet will become choked. So it will not break through the wind and it will be an unsuccessful gamma ray burst. It could, also be, it could also be that the jet just breaks from the wind and everything is fine and we'll, we'll call that successful. Or we can have a case in the middle where it's marginally successful. So it, it actually, it does not come out relativistic, but we have that the cocoon actually does emerge. So we will be able to see the cocoon, but maybe not the jet. So all of these three cases are going to be, are going to be important because we can then constrain, for example, the luminosity of the jet or the density of the medium if it's actually successful or unsuccessful. And another thing that I can, that I want to talk about that are results from our simulations are how important the interaction of the, the time of interaction of the jet and the wind is. So here what I'm showing is different density and Lorentz factor plots showing the results of the interaction of the jet with, with a spherical wind. So this is for different jet interaction times and time series. Now what we found is not at all surprising. We found that if the jet interacts with the wind a lot, the jet is going to be shaped more by the wind. So the longer they interact, the more shape it, you have, or the larger energy you have at larger angles. And we can show this. So here I'm just showing the normalized energy density, energy, energy profile as a function of the angle for all these different simulations. And let's focus on, for example, ones that have the same time of the wind, but different times of the jet, for example. So let's focus, sorry, different, different time, same duration of the jet, but different duration of the wind. So if we focus, for example, on this yellow one right here and on this purple one right here. So this purple one has a longer delay time, which means that the jet will interact more with the wind. And you can see from these two plots that you have larger energy, a larger angles, which again, it's not surprising. So we'll, with all of our simulations, let's up, then apply this to GW170817. So several groups have used different energy profiles in order to obtain light curves that are consistent with the emission from GW170817. So here the dashed lines represent those energy profiles from those different groups. And in the purple, pink, and blue, you can see the results from our simulation. So these are all the energy profiles that we got from our simulations. So one thing that is the takeaway from this plot is that we can actually reproduce this energy profile. So if we have that the jet interacts with, the, with different winds, we can reproduce the observations from GW170817. And also, of course, again, we need very, very large wind, wings in the jet in order to explain the observation or large energy at larger angles. Two minutes. No, thank you. Now, Let's just measure, so, so one other thing that we can do, and I won't go into a lot of detail, is then constrain 
the time of delay between, between the merger itself and the collapse to a black hole. So what we did was we, so we can measure how much energy is needed at our, our larger angles in order to reproduce observations, and we can compare it to the results from, the, from a simulation. So here what I'm plotting is the energy inside the core divided by the energy outside the core. So basically a small num a large number here means that the jet has a lot of energy and it's more, much more collimated, whereas the simulations right here have a lot of larger energy at larger angles. Again, this plot, uh, this plot, and this is just CW divided by T-jet. Again, this is not surprising at all because this tells you that the longer the jet and the wind interact with each other, the more structure the jet is going to have. So what we can conclude is that if we take all those energy profiles that correspond to, that reproduce the observations, we can actually constrain the delay time to be around like TW divided by TJ around 0.7, something like that. So it should be around here. So an additional constraint can come from asking that the jet has to remain active as it breaks from the wing. So if we actually put those two constraints together, we can see, here, so here I'm just showing the, first, the phase space where the time of collapse should live as a function of the mass loss rate. So this is pretty cool because using this information, we can constrain the delay time between the, collapse, between the merger itself and the collapse to a black hole. And this is all consistent with the literature. So just for conclusions, we, GW170817 show the structure, show, show the need for a structured jet, which can be done by having the jet interact with the surrounding medium. And this interaction of the jet can potentially not only shape the jet, but it could also choke it. And we can use numerical simulations in order to constrain very important binary parameters, such as the delay time, which we found to be around one second, which is consistent with the literature for GW170817. So thank you very much, and I'll take any questions if you, if you have any. Thank you, Ariadna. Oh, yes. Thank you, Ariadna. Uh, congrats on the baby and nice talk. Thank uh, you. I was just wondering if you could comment on the neutrino treatment and how that, yeah, how that bears on the, uh, yeah. the, the jet success and whatnot. So one thing we did, so that's a really good question. So our simulations in particular do not have neutrinos. So what we did was we actually, we took the data from the global simulations. So they used so from Albino Perego simulations, which they used a neutrino leakage scheme. And we got the density profile. So what we, what, let me see if I have it on the extra slides. So we, we only, yeah, here, here it is. So what we did was here is our density profile. So this profile, so this is for the neutrino driven wind. These were taken from Alvino Peregos' simulation. So this is, this is only what we put for our winds. And we just let it evolve. So at this point, the neutrinos are not going to matter because we're talking about this. This distances are 10 to the 14, 10 to the 15 centimeters. So we're pretty far out for this types of simulation. So the neutrinos are not going to matter that much. Just the, the profile, which of course will matter, but we took that from a different from global simulations with a neutrino liquid scheme. But very good question. I mean, they, they, it definitely will change everything. And one thing that we could do is we could try to do more, more, more simulations with different neutrino schemes on the jet, on basically the torus. We, put, we can put a torus and then a jet, but that has to be done with a GRMHT code. So with this code, we can only study the interaction at very, very large distances. Does that answer your question? More questions? If not, let's uh, thank Aradna again, and let's also thank all the speakers of today's session. I think that, yeah, that's it. We're going to reconvene in one hour with the first session of the day.